Do, do you have any positive things to say about Landon? Things that you thought that, that he did that were good or? Not particularly. Okay. I mean, like, okay. Several people along the way got kind of out in here and you just blasted it on Twitter and then that got loose. He forgot to remove a cell phone number. Oh, oh no. So, oh, so no. no. I personally was blindsided by that. Well, then why did they reset stacks? Oh man, that was it. Yeah, I forgot about that detail. Oh, wait, man. Like, using like photo shoots and stuff. Like, come on, man. That leads you right into my first question here. What the fuck? What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and welcome to the Doug Polk Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the Heads Up No Limit match between Bill Perkins and Landon Tice, which ended in a shocking concession from Landon just the other day. Came sort of out of left field as they'd played about a fourth of the hands and Landon was only a couple buy-ins behind the nine big blinds per 100 pace that he needed to maintain. This is our first episode back after a while and it's a doozy. We have three separate guests all here to give you some different perspective about the match. We're kicking things off with a good friend of mine, Jason Moe. Many of you may know him from old school husband no limit battling or maybe following the cryptocurrency space over the last five or six years. Uh, he's got his own opinions about what went down in the landed match, and of course, he's never afraid to fire some shots. Second up, we have Kevin Rabichow in the mix. He is one of the best heads of element players on the planet. I've played him, and I can confirm that he is very, very good. And he was the lead coach behind the heads up no limit match uh, on Landon's side. He talks about behind the scenes, what things were like, the thought process that went into having to concede, and really kind of gets into some details to give you a better idea of what was going on uh, in, in Camp Landon. And then, of course, third and finally, we have the victor of the match. Bill Perkins joins the pod to talk about his experience playing, what it was like studying and learning, his thoughts about what happened between the two camps, maybe some of the shit talking, and also an honest take on what he thought about the nine big blind handicap. All of this and more coming your way today. But before we jump into those conversations with our guests, I want to talk about a few things first. I've relocated from Las Vegas, Nevada to Austin, Texas. I'm not totally set up, as you can probably tell from the not great audio quality here on the mic. The video quality is a bit grainy, and then there's no posters on my wall, which we will definitely have at some point. But I wanted to get in the mix on making some content. My plan moving forward is simple. I'm going to be doing a weekly podcast long form on topics that I'm interested in. It will primarily be poker and cryptocurrency. I'm sure it can include gambling at large, political betting, sports or sports betting. I, the YouTube landscape of interesting things are happening there. Basically, we're going to have a variety of guests on to talk about different topics. This podcast is going to be quite different from the Joe Ingram podcast where he has guests on and it's more of a focus on them. And he's done some great ones recently, the Tom Dwan one, the Phil Ivey one. These are podcasts that you can learn about some of the best players in poker. I want to keep this more based, more geared around topics and getting guests on to discuss those topics with a little bit more focus. So it's going to be more of a focused discussion than an interview type format. Additionally, this podcast is going to be posted weekly, so if you're interested in checking it out, you can follow along on uh, on YouTube at Doug Polk Podcast or on any podcast app. We're going to eventually be up on all of them, the Doug Polk Podcast. You can find me there as well. I do want to quickly mention my podcast before was only cryptocurrency topics, so if you don't want to hear about anything else and that will tilt you, then by all means, you can unsubscribe. But... I think you might enjoy this. A lot of, there's a lot of crossover between poker and gambling and cryptocurrency, so you might want to stick around. I think you might end up enjoying it. All right, without those things out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in. Our first guest, Jason Moe, and his thoughts on the Landon Bill Perkins Challenge. We are now joined by a longtime friend of mine, a high-stakes poker player turned into cryptocurrency investor, uh, a, an old roommate of mine in several different cities along the way. Jason Moe joins us. Thanks for ho hopping on, man. Ah, no problem. Happy to be here. So I, I like to hear that you're happy because some of the some of the stuff I've seen online has seemed a little a little sharp lately, um, a, a little bit aggressive. But uh, what's let, let's talk about this Land and Tice Perkins challenge. Obviously, that's why I had you on here today. Um, what are your what are your general thoughts just coming into this? What did you think about the challenge, and and what did you think about how this this thing ended? Because I, I thought it was a bit of a shock. Um, yeah, I was I was shocked as well. Um, I, I thought Landon was likely going to lose the challenge, but um, I thought that the challenge would at least complete or at least make it to the 50% mark. Um, when I was booking action, I had the option of booking like a cross book or booking um, action straight up with the 9BB handicap. And I thought uh, 
the higher EV play was to look cross books because um, it, if Bill was better than Landon, um, I'm capturing like the full upside of his EV BB um, win, win rate. Whereas if I'm just betting on the, the match spread, like there's a limit as to the amount I win. And that kind of fucked me because I didn't see the challenge I think with, I, I think Bill essentially won like two or three buy-ins, two and a half buy-ins considering the handicap. Um, I thought that if it was going to be a victory, it would be like a bloodbath in one way or the other. Uh, so th I think that was the biggest shocking part that didn't seem like Landon was doing that bad. Yeah, it, it actually, it kind of reminds me of when I played Negreanu where a lot of people were trying to bet Negreanu with Crossbook. I think, I, I remember Mercier bet a bunch of people, I think, and there, there were some other guys in the mix that were trying to um, basically get the Crossbook on because if Negreanu was actually as good as me or better, then it's a bloodbath, right? You just lose yeah, yeah, piles exactly. of lights. So you're kind of getting on the yeah. other side there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think the when we talk about how long it went on for, it's it's weird to me because from the outside looking at it, it it, it it's just nonsensical. It's he's only two and a half buy-ins behind pace. I think he had to be up about four and a half five buy-ins to be at the big buy per uh, the nine. He, he was, um, I think he was like on pace, uh, literally like a session or two before, right? He had like one losing session where he lost like less than a buy-in, and that put him off pace. But um, like I think he was like at eight point five or nine BB, like maybe like 500 hands ago. So um, yeah, I think that was like the most shocking thing. I mean, when you played Daniel, I think you were down like 4K hands into the match, right? Like maybe a little bit before. I think I think but, it was around two and a half or something, two and a half, three. But I I, I basically had a, a small upswing out of the gate and then I dropped 10 straight. I, the, the swings were actually much bigger in that match and that match had smaller swings than some of the normal matches I've had. So if you look at the Bill Landon graph, it's not even that swingy. It looks yeah, swingy be because the, the numbers, or the graph just is, is spiky, but the number of actual buy-ins wasn't even that crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in the end, like, he was up, like, what, one and a half, two buy-ins, and he had to pay, like, a, like a two and a half to three buy-in handicap. I mean, maybe a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, it was, like, it, it, like, if he didn't quit, like, from an outsider's perspective, like the, the match was relatively close. It wasn't like Landon was getting completely blown out. So yeah, it's, it's odd to say the least, but I, I think it makes sense after like to seeing what like his coaches had to say. I mean, like it, it's not necessarily about the results. It's like they, they look at the hand history. They're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? This guy's like retarded. So we can't continue backing him. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's, that's essentially the gist of it. That is the gist of it. And that brings me to the next thing I want to talk about, which was, you tweeted out some leaked Discord screenshots that caused a little bit of a yeah, stir. I feel bad about that. I, uh, I shouldn't have done that to Clicker. I, I, I feel several people <laughs> along the way got kind of outed here, and you just blasted it on Twitter, and then that got loose, and then obviously before you know, everyone's talking about this. Um, and and yeah. I, so I, I talked a little bit too Clicker, but he, he I think he didn't want to come on and, and have to deal with the... Yeah, he, he, he's a nice guy, so... Yeah. He's young, man. He can't even drink in America. He's 20 years old. Yeah, he, he's, he's younger than Landon, right? He's younger, yeah, two years younger than Landon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a half, two years younger, yeah. Um, so, so for those of you guys that haven't seen the screenshots, basically, uh, Clicker was discussing. So, okay, can I actually? I should say this: the coaching scheme seemed really whack for this. Yeah. They had a bunch of different coaches, including coaches in sort of different camps, you know. And that's mm -hmm. the weirdest thing because when you play heads up no limit, you have your crew, right? You have your group of guys, yeah. and then there's opposing groups. And, yeah, exactly. and so it made sense to me seeing Frab and Clicker, they were coaching him, but then also uh, Kevin Rabichow, who, who we're going to have on the pod a little bit later today, he's coaching as well. It, how many chefs can you have in the kitchen here? That, that, it felt like overkill to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess it made sense from his team. Like it, it, it's not like the people that were backing him were going to give them any reasonable advice as to how to win this. So they just outsourced who they thought were the, the best coaches. But um, yeah, like I, I think the big thing is it's, it's not necessarily about the coaching, but it's about the uh, the individual, right? I mean, like you and I both know we, we, we've coached some people that like are are very good or, or that have become very good, and we've also coached some people that like just didn't make it, right? Yeah, I love the so, Jason Mo coaching style, by the way. <laughs> uh, so we'd be in the same room. You just got pictures that we're in Vancouver. And I just hear, what the fuck is it? This? this is fucking terrible. What the fuck is this? This is awful. <laughs> what are you doing? And I just, 
yeah. I look over and, and there's some there's a poker trucker hands up and, and I, whatever poor guy is the other side. <laughs> oh man, those are some good times. But yeah, I, I think I think as far as the coaching goes from this, I don't think anyone's questioning the coaches, right? You've got um, the two guys I worked with, they're phenomenal. They're basically on top of, of the ecosystem online. And then uh, I've, I was going to say, we're reading the two plus two thread. I think there are people that are like questioning, questioning the coaching. They're, they're saying that like you're likely to beat Daniel without coaching, which I, I don't think is true. And, and like um, the, the coaching didn't add that much value to what, what you were doing. So maybe okay. like the coaches were overhyped. I mean, but these people know nothing, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, they're, they're just on the forums. I, I've, I've actually looked at this stuff and studied this stuff. And the amount, okay, this is actually, I think, a really important thing. That, and it's a mistake that Landon make, made. I think Landon was way too focused on looking cool about studying and talking about being in the lab instead of actually being in the fucking lab, you know? Yeah. When, course, I, when, I, when, I, when I was prepping, I, I spent a ton of time actually running my own sims and grinding it out. Because it's one thing for a guy to say, hey, do this thing. And then it's another to take that and then be able to actually do it in real time versus an opponent that's trying to beat you. Those are those are totally different things. And, and to recognize those spots constantly. So I, I think he needed to spend a lot more time doing that. But I, I think it's a, a much bigger deal than what's been made out. The fact that it wasn't a unified coaching team where they would be comfortable fully talking to each other. I mean, I, I don't know what, what Kevin's situation is like, but they're not in the same crew. They don't have pieces of each other. They're... They, you want a unified team, right? At least for Bill. I know people make fun of hybrid poker all the time. Um, but at least for Bill, he has a team behind him that are working together and have done a, a project like this with Negranu. And they're not going to feel like there's a weird, oh, what can I say? What can I not say? Sort of what are the lines? He, I just feel like there were too many people all doing this. He needed one good coach that was really the primary resource and then let everyone get out of the way. And, and any of those people are fine. Any of them. Yeah. I think the other thing he lacked was like structure in what he was doing. Like, um, I mean, I, I prepped some heads up matches with you. So like, I, I know the work that you put into it, but it, it, a lot of it is like you play a session and you get the hands, like you spend next to amount of hours, like reviewing the hands, looking at like decision trees, looking at what your opponent's doing, uh, looking at what you're doing and then making adjustments session by session and then repeating that. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, like, I saw your interview when you um, talked about, like, your prep work with, uh, for, for the Daniel and Grinder Challenge, and it seemed, like, pretty similar. Like, you just had, like, a daily routine where you would play, and then you would have, like, notes prepared for you, you had frequencies prepared for you, you'd study all this. So, at, every day, you're, like, your BB for 100 probably rose because you were getting better at playing Daniel the more, the more you uh, played and the more you worked well, on it. It was weird with that one because we were on a site with no hand histories. So, it... It, it it really limited your ability. It was a little bit tougher. Yeah, but you were still yeah. doing stuff like having yeah. people like uh, record frequencies and stuff. So, so you, yeah. you, you, you knew what he was up to. We had the full upswing team. I, I got to give a shout out to our lab members. I said, okay, who who's ready for some grunt work? And I remember back in the day, I had to, I had to get my friend Jason Moe to do the grunt work. Remember the Isildur spreadsheets? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was uh, yeah, I remember that. Um, in Melbourne. I mean, this is like well before we had solvers. I mean, we just had to manually calculate like slots. Imagine like the computational power of computers now, I like uh, us doing that pen and paper basically for like hours and hours and hours. And, and like, yeah. uh, it's a testament to like, I guess your mental fortitude because like the one time we did that, like we, we did it after a session where you just got absolutely waxed by, by yep. this little right? Yep. Like yep. you must have lost, I don't know, like a million? It was something no, huge. I, I think I lost 700K. It was a cap session. Yeah, yeah. And, it was and a 30 BB cap on Full Tilt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, were, yeah. We, were, we were in Melbourne, and I, I think it was what my second or third biggest loss ever in a session at the time. Maybe, I think it was my second biggest. And I just went to the gym super pissed off. And then I came back and I was like, we're going to do spreadsheet work all night. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, I, I, was, I was up to like 4 a.m. or something doing spreadsheet work. And he, Caitlin was in the mix, too. We like even outsourced some spreadsheet work to her. It was, uh, it was great. Oh, those are good times. Oh, that was back when you kind of had to figure out your own thing. It was, uh, it was a different yeah. time. Um, but, yeah. but so going back to this, though, I, I, I don't think that the coaches like I know these guys. These guys are good. All, all of them are good. Uh, and then I can't say definitively Landon didn't put in the time, but from a lot of the messages, it seemed from what Clicker was saying, it, it felt like he was very frustrated with 
the coaching that was happening and then his ability to actually implement what, what, what they were talking about. Yeah. The, the, the one thing that really stuck out to me was the clicker saying like, um, he was unable to differentiate spots. Um, and like the example he gave was like, uh, delay versus turn pro versus like the same spot out of position in a three bet pot where um, he thought, I think Bill was either over bluffing or under bluffing a certain spot in a single race pot. So he wrote out adjustment to, to counter that. And then um, like, if you don't have like the mental framework to understand like what the adjustment is or what like uh, under bluffing, like say the turn probe spot means for your, uh, your check rings, um, stuff like that. Um, you, like the information doesn't mean anything to you. Like you can't, you can't implement it. And like, it seemed like he didn't understand the difference between like three bet pots out of a position um, in check back spots versus like uh, single race pots in position. Um, um, so he was implementing like the wrong strategy in certain spots and he, he made some folds that he shouldn't have, he made some bets that he shouldn't have. And like the, I guess it, it's not on anyone besides Landon, but um, like it just seemed like the, the information just wasn't getting through. Like he wasn't like uh, able to implement it. Um, he didn't have enough reps. Um, like you, you have you to get, you, yeah, exactly. If you want to have, if you want to get good at heads up, you you just need to be in there, battle everyone. Um, like you face a, a bunch of different styles, you face a bunch of different spots, um, and then you just like learn along the way. Um, well, when he was preparing for the match, he was like, for some reason, he was talking so much shit. Like he was talking shit to me. He was talking shit to like. Yeah. What um, exactly did he say to you? Because I saw in your post you were talking about that a little bit. What what, what happened exactly there? Oh, um, so he, he was saying he was looking for challengers for heads up, and um, like um, I, I'm still like really close with all the guys that uh, I, I coached in the past. I mean, you know, most of them. Um, so. Like, I thought this would be a good opportunity for them to get some action, considering, like, how dead the heads, uh, heads up landscape is. Um, so, like, I was just, like, in jest sort of just talking shit back to him, saying, like, if you wanted to play these guys, I'll set up a match. So then, like, eventually, um, when the challenge got booked, he uh, he was like, yeah, okay, I'll play. So I, I, gave, I gave his contact to maybe, like, four or... I think like four people that are like legit that heads up players. Um, and he essentially refused to play all of them. Uh, well, I, I, after you made that post yesterday, one of them messaged me and said, yeah, like um, after you gave me his contact, um, he sent me like his Discord link and it was like a fake Discord. He messaged the guy and the guy was like, yeah, I don't play poker. Sorry, you must have the wrong guy. So I, it was it was absolutely That's ridiculous. And the other people he, he was offering to play um, like two tables on HCR at three six, but like only within like a certain time frame. So if you have like one hour or two hours a day, and for some reason like time zone differences don't work. Uh, the, the way I saw it was if you're preparing for a heads up challenge, like if someone was to play at a certain time, and you, you know that the, the that work that you're getting will be beneficial to you, you just make it no matter what. Right? Well, it's good for you. It's actually yeah, yeah. it's actually good for you to schedule times because if you do that, you don't. It takes away the process of finding a match. And then it guarantees you good reps and then you can get in, you know, you can get a bunch of spots to study and see where you're at. I mean, it makes sense. If I had a challenge, I wouldn't be booking huge, long challenges for other people, but I would be playing very active. I mean, play every day and, and get a, a sample of hands in. Um, so I find well, that when you were playing, when you were playing the grind, you were before you were playing the grind, and you were obviously like very, very rusty from not playing for a while. Yeah. Um, it seemed um, like you were playing a lot of people. I, I had a lot of people like message me, like saying like, um yeah i played doug at two four or three six and i won like four or five buy-ins off yeah like i got him good stuff like that but i mean it, it, it actually doesn't mean anything but it's like it just shows that you were like in the streets just taking on all, all challengers right yeah so basically i started off playing one dollar two dollar and then two four and then three six and then five ten and i just worked all the way up and then right before i played negrano at 200 400 i was playing 51 and some one two and stuff like that so I, I mean, I was I was brutally terrible out of the gate. I, I had forgotten everything. My sizes were awful. I obviously did no solver work. I, yeah. I I was I was getting fucked up by people at one two. They were just they were bringing it. And I just didn't have what it took to took to fight back. You know. Um, so yeah, yeah you, you gotta you gotta get those reps in, and, and that's that's a big part of it. But it, it, it's strange to me uh, that that he wouldn't 
he wouldn't play those people. I, I wonder what happened there. I'm sure I'm sure he has some thoughts. But what what shit talking did he do? Because one thing I felt like from a shit talking perspective, it was a lot of the solve for why guys. I feel really got in there on the shit talking about how good Landon was, and um, you know Bill has no chance, and all these kinds of things. And um, you know, which by the way, Bill said he says this later in this pod that. Why would you say that like, when it got back to him? He, oh, yeah, well, fuck you. Now I'm not going to go boating today. Yeah. I'm going to run some Sims. You know, what are you doing with that? But did you yeah. actually have Landon talk shit to you or was it more of his team? No, it, it was him. He was like, um, I, well, I mean, I guess it was, it was more me than anything else. Uh, I, That's I definitely true. The, <laughs> I, I offered him to, to play these guys and then he, he would just say like, uh, um, I forgot what he actually said, but he's like, oh, I can't wait to play like the quote unquote crushers that, that, that you stake. Um, and then I, I forgot what else, uh, what else he said. I'll, I'll have to look it back at the old, old, old tweets, but he was, yeah, I don't, I don't even remember. It was, it was so long ago. It was like, um, I mean, like the, the, the challenge came to first in like months and months ago, right? Just like the beginning of the year. And then it took a while for uh, the action to start. And for a while he was like, quote unquote, looking for action to practice when he, really wasn't looking for action to practice, which I, I thought that, that was the most telling thing that yeah. um, if, 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 if he's not going to play like the best dudes, even at like mid stakes, then there's no way he's going to get good in a short amount of time. Yeah. That, I mean, may, maybe he had his hands full, maybe he had enough action already, or, or I, I can't say, but then I see tweets where he's playing live tournaments. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know, yeah, why, yeah, exactly. what, what, why is this, why are you spending your time here? Um, I also think it was kind of weird. I'm just kind of reading into his tweets, right? We decided to, we decided to surrender or whatever that we decided to concede. Uh, there was a lot of language we in his post. And, and I think it's kind of obvious that he didn't want to quit, but just the, the, I mean, he has such a small percentage of himself that the people that really actually get to decide said, you know, we're not going to keep backing you here. Um, but I, I, I have to say, I, I think it's, I think it's pretty weak sauce on the backers front to be ready to throw in the towel this early on. I mean, even if the coaches are saying, Hey, this is going bad. You're one fourth of the way in. You're not even that far behind pace. What, what were the backers thinking where they were ready to throw in the flag at this point, this early? Yeah. Um, like he had to win what, like a 10 or 11 BB per hundred for the rest of the challenge to win. He was winning at three in the handicap. It was like three and a half, four The the handicap was nine. Um, I mean, I think if you run the numbers, like even if he's only winning at like four BB per hundred, he still wins the challenge in the side bet, like maybe like 25% of the time. I'm just like a rough estimate off the top of right. my head. Um, but I, I think that what happened was it's like his, his coaches said like, yeah, this guy's hopeless. He's like, he's not improving um, session by session. Uh, it, it's not like Bill's getting worse. If anything, Bill's probably getting better as the as, as the challenge progresses. Uh, he might be winning at like three big blind per hundred now, but which means like we have to take a, a six big blind per hundred loss for another 15k hand. So at that point, this becomes like an equity and an EV calculation. It's rather just, um, what did they bet 200k on the side? So like yeah. they might have like 50, 60 K worth of equity in that 200 K side bet um, for him to win if his win rate um, doesn't improve. And then you just like, uh, you, it's just an equity calculation on losing that versus losing like six big line hundred at 200, 400 for another 15,000 hands. So I, I get the EV side of it when you look at it like that and you simple EV calc, but I think there kind of has to be something that something to be said here of like, if we're going to do challenges and we're going to have them be super easy to quit in the moment, someone's thinking, eh, maybe I'm not winning. I quit. What's the fucking point of a challenge? Why are we going to yeah. let's throw down? Oh, we're 24% of the way in. And I don't think I'm going to win. So we're going to just hang up the gloves. I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't understand that. The, the, the amount of money won um, and, and lost in this challenge um, as opposed to like how much it was hyped up as like this, High stakes heads up death match um, is just like pathetic. I, I mean, either the team Landon didn't lose that much money, right? They, they lost the side bet, but they were likely to lose that side bet anyway. And then they lost like a few buy ins in a game where you can swing like a few VOD buy ins over maybe like 100 hands, right? Right. I, it's hard to say exactly how much Landon have, had of himself. So this is just pure speculation, but. Let's just assume he had 10% of himself and some rumors seem to think that it's slower than that. 
Yeah, I was told it was a lot lower, but yeah. Okay, so whatever, let's say it's seven and a half percent. Well, then every every buy-in is, so um, what, $2,500? So he would have lost two, two and a half buy-ins. So $5,500 and then whatever amount of the side bet he had, which could have been none. I, I don't know what the side bet situation yeah. was. Maybe he, yeah. had, maybe he had five, 10K. I mean, Landon might have lost 15 to 20K here. This is not some soul crushing high stakes <laughs> defeat. You know, this is. This yeah, is, yeah. It, it, it's kind of a joke. Like, you know what's actually, think about this. Okay. I was thinking this the other day. So Bill cross booked a bunch on the side, bigger stakes than he was playing. Right? Yeah. So. Bill was effectively playing 501k, okay, in that vicinity. Yeah. And then Landon had 5% of himself or whatever, 10%, we'll call it something yeah, in that yeah. vicinity. He was playing um, 510. So Bill was playing, they were playing the same game in a heads up match, and Bill was playing approximately 100x the stakes. Yeah. It's kind of insane. Oh. Yeah, um, I, I actually bet a lot on Bill when I, I was like, I'm sure what side to bet because um, I remember talking to you about it um, really early on and you you said you played Landon and he like played okay in a small sample, it probably was a little bit spewy. Um, I talked to some other regs, they essentially said the same thing, like he, he, he wasn't like over folding spots or he wasn't getting run over, um, but he, he wasn't particularly good at heads up. Um, so, so like, I, I wasn't completely sure, uh, like which side to bet on. I, I just didn't believe in him at all. I mean, like, if you just look, look at his track record, like he's played almost no heads up, right? The, the people that, that, that are like good at heads up these days have played like hundreds and thousands of hands. They, they've studied for right. hours and hours and years, stuff like that. And it, it's not like that there's like a magic pill that you, you get ex-coach and suddenly you're like one of the best players in the world. It, it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, but what would actually slowed me down on, on booking action was like people I was booking action against or cross booking against were people I respect a decent amount and heads up who have like, uh, who, who have done like really well and heads up. But like in retrospect, uh, their logic was, uh, Bill's a fish. I've seen Bill play on high stakes poker. He doesn't know what he's doing. And Landon's getting coached by some of the best players in the world that that this should be a beat down. Yeah. But like, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't work like that, right? Like that, that, That's not like proper logic. That's the way to evaluate I think, a, a match. I think there was also a little bit of blood in the water from the match that I had versus Dean Eggs, and people were thinking, same coaching team behind them. Yeah. Eh, yeah. A little blood in the water. The Sharks yeah, swim yeah. over. This this looks pretty good, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I remember we, we discussed that as well, right? You thought that... Um, he thought that Landon chose his team correctly. He, he has some of the best people working with him. And, yeah. and the, the, the Bills team was essentially worse than Landon's going into the challenge. Oh, un, I mean, of course, Bill wouldn't agree with that. But I, I think almost undoubtedly Landon's team of players behind him. I mean, the, as players, they are. I mean, they've just beaten all these other high stakes people. So they are. Yeah, yeah. And then as coaches, yeah. you could debate. Um, Bill thinks that the software that they have that they use is extremely good. I haven't seen it. He's ranted mm -hmm. about it for years. One day, I think they had some beta thing coming up soon, so maybe we'll get we'll get to actually see what it's all about. But I mean, I think I think from the team perspective, uh, Landon absolutely had had the right guys behind him. Um, I, I also think when you look at the challenge, when you look at it from the perspective of people just thinking Bill's a fish, it it was tough on my. I didn't end up betting. Um, I've chatted a bunch with Landon. We've played a few sessions. Uh, I think he just tried to run a bunch of bluffs for me, and I am extremely stationary. Did not work out for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, He's running these weird, crazy back raise bluffs, and then once once you know that people are capable of those, it, they they just get way worse. You know, those are yeah. those, they're good until you get caught once. But anyway, basically, um, I played both of them a lot, and I I, I kind of thought nine was fair ish. Uh, at at, a, at points, I leaned towards betting Bill. I think I even tweeted before the whole thing started. I I have a hard time seeing Landon covering it if Bill actually plays pretty well. It's going to be hard to cover that. Um, as not an elite reg, I think I actually just nailed it in my first tweet about the whole thing. But basically, I, I didn't, I just didn't think that there was a lot of edge either way. So I kind of sat out, but I saw Bill's play. Bill played me. Bill has played me more poker. Other than Dean Eggs, I've played the most hands versus Bill in the last year or two or whatever, by far. I've, yeah. played, I've played thousands of hands versus Bill. Okay. So I've seen a lot of Bill. I know, I know what he's capable of. I know how he plays. And the thing is, he he's he's capable of making mistakes that Landon would never make 
like a uh, triple off with a second pair type of hand where you're thinking yeah. oh, what's going on. Right. Um, but those became way less frequent and it was way more, it became way more solid or there was one built hand that was particularly hilarious that we played. So I opened Queens, he three bet, I four bet, he called seven, seven, four rainbow check. I bet one fifth pot. He check raises leaving, leaving 10 big blinds for the road. I jam and he folds. So I went at 200 <laughs> big blind pot. Um, I wonder what he had actually, I should have asked him when he was, but any, basically, you know, Bill was capable of stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah. it, it started to happen less and less and less. Yeah. And when you're thinking about an edge like nine, you kind of need some of those punts to cover the spread if you're not really good, right? If you're not close, yeah. like getting those small edges, you need something to make up that difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my logic was that um, at nine BBs, um, unless someone has huge preflop weeks or leaks and spots that come up very frequently, um, it, or they just randomly punt off stacks every like couple hundred hands. Um, you're just not going to cover that unless you're very, very good. So if, if Bill figures out like proper preflop strat, his bet frequencies are within a certain range, his call frequencies are within a certain range, um, which like is deemed acceptable. It's really uh, tough to, to cover that spread unless he's like really giving it away at certain spots. Yeah. And, and I've gone back and forth on this. Did they quit because, or did Landon quit because he was worse than, pe than his coaches thought? Or did they quit because Bill was better? I'm sure that both things kind of played a role, right? Um, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if people, if the, their team was looking at Bill and thinking, holy shit, this guy's actually playing pretty reasonable. You know, I, I, his yeah. pre-flop stuff is going to be good. You know, I, I know that, I know if he plays like Negrano, he's going to play good pre-flop. And then his yeah. post-flop size has made sense. Um, most yeah, of them made exactly. sense in places. Yeah. So all of a sudden it becomes really quickly where are you going to get your edge and it, your edge has to be, you're really good. If you're not really good, there's, yeah, you're just going to lose. Right. So maybe, yeah. maybe Bill should get more credit than, than I think people have been giving him. Yeah. I actually give Bill all the credit in the world. I mean, he, a lot of people just wrote him off saying that like he wasn't going to try, he was going to be on his boat all day, and he was like, oh, whatever, whatever Bill Perkins does. But, but, it, but it seems like, I mean, I, I think it's likely he, he played more hands in preparation than Landon did. He, he worked harder yeah, than, than awesome. Landon did to, to, to get good at the game. Um, whereas, like, the ratio of work that Landon um, should have been doing was to, to Bill was, I mean, like, Landon should be working, like, 10 times harder than Bill, right? Like, Bill, this is just, like, a casual challenge. See, he's not going to be afraid. The money doesn't mean to him. Like, for Landon, it seemed like it was... I mean, it's like the, the way you should look at it, if you were landing, it's just like, this is life or death. You're like, yeah. entire poker career is on the line. Like this, it's do or die here. Like um, you only have one shot at this. You can't, you can't fuck up. You can't fuck up this badly. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, he, yeah. He, yeah he, he just seemed more interested in like, like the whole spectacle of the thing, right? Like, oh, look at me. I'm playing high stakes. Um, I have this challenge against a quote unquote billionaire. Um, and then like, He's just like posting stuff on Twitter. He's I guess playing tur tournaments. He's like chatting with people. I, I don't I don't know about what he's doing, but um, I, I mean, if, if if I was like a 22 year old kid um, with like almost no money to my name, and this is my opportunity to make money, um, I, I'd bunker down. I'd, I'd wake up, be in the lab, play, be in the lab some more, play some more, and then be like absolutely prepared, have all, all my corners covered for. For, for a match like this and it was clear like just the prep work wasn't there good point and i think the main thing that you're highlighting here is that when you do a challenge the point of the challenge is to win the point of the challenge is not posting about it on twitter the po talking about putting in work posting pictures on instagram yeah, instagram yeah. stories that's it's about winning the challenge. If it's not about winning the challenge, then what are you doing, right? That's that's what, what was what was that one tweet that uh, someone sent it to me? Um, uh, Landon said like people have been saying like I'm a good player, or and, and then you responded saying I, I haven't heard anyone say that, but uh, oh, I'll keep an ear but, out. But, but, uh, I'll keep my ear out. <laughs> I, I forgot the exact wording, but I, I just I just found that, I just found that hilarious. I mean, yeah, like it, well, well, what is he doing? It's just, like so unnecessary to be like. Well, but posting this shit when, when he should be like hunkered down studying, right? Yeah. Or like, so another example of this is, is, is Joe Ingram. Obviously he's done a lot of stuff. 
publicly too, right? Just pause stuff. But when he did challenges, he went all in. That guy was 24 tabling 20 hours a day to win whatever yeah, the, yeah. The hundreds of thousands of hands he had to play, right? The, yeah. the, it's okay to embrace the spectacle part of the challenge and be in the limelight, but your focus has to be to win the games, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, people don't love Tom Brady because he has laser eyes on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they love Tom Brady because he wins Super Bowls. That's what it's yeah, about. He, it's about winning he, Super Bowls. Yeah, he, uh, he, he does the work in the background. So people, I mean, if, if he didn't do the work in the background, he wouldn't be Tom Brady, right? So, like, uh, it, it, it seemed like Landon did just wanted to, like, all the everything that came with the challenge without actually understanding what he needed to do to win a challenge and then executing that. So before, before we conclude here, do we, do, do you have any positive things to say about Landon? things that you thought that, that he did that were good or, or, you know, any maybe words of wisdom, some nice things to say here to, to close out. Um, not particularly. I, okay. I mean, like, okay. I'm, 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 I'm actually kind of upset that like I didn't make enough or, or much money on this thing because um, I, I only had crossbooks and like uh, so 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 like the, the first thing is is I, I would have went a lot bigger had it not been for I was betting mostly against heads up players and that was a little bit of a red flag to me like I. I and it was like a bit of a standoff when I was talking to them. They would ask me if I I had inside information. I would say, no, I just like I can see it in this kid's eyes. He just doesn't have it. He's, he's not going to win. I mean, to, to be fair, Jay, mother, you did hit me up for inside information. I had to say I'm not going to give. I, I said I'd give you like what I'd say publicly, but I'm not going to give you yeah, all the yeah. teeth. So yeah, I yeah. mean, you very easily could have had some inside information. <laughs> Yeah, but and, you did. And then it was just like it was just like a bit of a standoff where, where like I would ask them like if they had insider information, they would say like uh, no, it was just like I played him for like like a hundred hands. He played okay for a hundred hands. I think Bill's a fish. Um, he, he's getting coached by someone good. Like he should win in theory. Um, so like I probably would have booked like like three or four times more action that had had um, had uh, that not happened. Um, and, and also like. So the whole way the, the crossbook ended, I mean, if, if I had just piled in on straight spread bets um, of, of him losing the challenge, uh, I, I would have made like quite a bit more. But instead, um, essentially, I, I crossbook maybe like 25 to 30 percent of the stakes um, and, and at various times. And he lost essentially like two and a half fines of in those games where like if um, if the challenge had been concluded, um, I'm pretty positive I would have been up like 15, 20 buy-ins. Definitely, um, definitely. If, if, if they just let it run. So yeah, I was kind of upset about that, about how like how pussy-ish the whole thing was that he just like quits even being at par or um, close to uh, at par with the handicap, like within like a few hundred hands. Um, I, I thought if you quit, it'd be like at the 10K hand mark. Where maybe he was like losing, like he was that losing at like two BB per hundred, and he needed to win at like fifteen to twenty BB per hundred um, for the remainder of the challenge to to, to cover the spread. His team like look at it and say like, all right, we're not doing this. Um, we, we might as well just just pay the side back and get off. But yeah, I, I was a little bit upset as to how quickly the uh, challenge ended. I was I was hoping more blood in the streets. It it seems like the real the real bet in retrospect was bill money line to win. Um, yeah, that, that, what were the odds for five to one? What was the, what were the odds on bill to win? Uh, I mean, you mean, you mean straight up, straight up win, not handy. Yeah. 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 I don't even know if there's a line for that. Um, but I'm sure there was, and I'm sure it was a good one and I'm sure those people are pretty happy. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, It had to be something around there. Uh, that, that, and, and, and one more note I wanted to make on the coaching thing. I think there's a real misconception in poker. I'm sure you've seen this with a lot of the guys that you worked with. And I saw this along the way. I mean, I coached so many guys in heads up and most of them failed brutally, even yeah, though I was there. They, coaching they didn't them. make it. Yeah. yeah. Didn't make exactly. it. Right? I had, exactly. I had, I had, I love saying this. I think my top five students made me 110% of my money, something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and yeah. then the rest were net losers as a combined group, but then the, the Jimmy's, the dongs, those guys, yeah, they, they yeah. killed it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was the same for, for me, right? Like, I, I gave like each one of my horses like the, the same amount of coaching, the, the the same amount of getting bitched at, and some just some like did really well. Like, there are some today that 
you, you know, like uh, even after I quit, they became like a lot better than me. That they were going to be like top five, top ten players in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're like, I mean, I still keep in touch with a lot of them. They're they're like some of my best friends in the world. They're super successful. Um, and then the, there's others that um, don't make it past like one two, and don't make it past two four. And it's it's not a testament to the coach or the, the process. It's a testament to the individual. Like some people have it, and, and some people just don't have it. And I mean, yeah. like. It, it's easy for me to say in retrospect, but um, it, it was just like super clear to me that like Landon didn't have it. Well, there's like a few... he, he, he wasn't he he, 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 he like he, he's not about that life, right? He, he, he's not about the the heads up, grind, get really good, learn um, stuff like that. Like using like photo shoots and stuff. Like, come on, man. Never good when you're doing photo shoots instead of playing your hands. And when when you look at some of the players in, in heads up. It can be a few different things, right? Sometimes people just don't, sometimes the students are, just don't really want to listen. Like in their mind, they have, this is right. And then the coach tells them something and they, and they think, well, no, I'm right. I, I, I knew better. You know, I, yeah. I know what's going on. Or, or they think they had a read. Lord knows how many times you're looking through a sample and then yeah. someone, well, he did this in another hand. So then I played yeah. my hand like an idiot because what about that other hand? And then uh, the, the best, the best students, they're just sponges. They just ask why they learn from you and they try and implement it. And then, yeah. and then once you get to a certain level, once, once a player gets to high stakes, right. And they're actually a, a proven good winner in the game, then you give them a little more leeway. And it's, yeah, yeah. if, if you've gotten this far, okay. When it's close, you know, make the decision you think is right. And if you need to, if you need to go with your read and be willing to step out then go for it. But when you're playing mid stakes and you've not beaten anyone, you need to just learn what correct is and, and not yeah. worry about your, your, what you think the game is like, cool story, bro. You t- tell yeah, me exactly. more about what you think is correct. Yeah, that was, exactly. was a pet peeve of mine. It, uh, in terms of if you bring up Timmy and Dom, I mean, I, I think the, the reason that they were successful is they're just machines, right? They, they're like, I, I mean, I live with Jimmy, I live with Dom, like they, they wake up, they're on their computer until they go to bed, right? It's, it's like absolutely ridiculous. Like I, I've seen them like 14 hours a day sitting side by side, just like waiting for action, chatting about poker, it, you know, like yeah. they're, they're on the grind. So, I mean, it, it's, it, I'm just like, not, not a dig at you or anything, but I'm, I'm just like saying like, they're, they're probably gonna be pretty successful um, even if like, you're not like walking them along the way, whereas someone else you're coaching that um, spends a few hours a day on it, maybe like sits tables, um, waits for action, puts in like a couple hundred hands and goes and does whatever else. Right. Uh, no matter like as much, like whatever coaching you give them, it's, it's not like, it, it's not gonna improve them as much as just being dedicated to what you're doing. Well, those guys were two pretty special cases because they they grinded so hard. I mean, both machines, of them, they're absolute machines. Both of them for sure, but especially Jimmy. I know that they were both machines, but Jimmy yeah, took yeah. it to another level. Jimmy would wake up, get out of his bed, and just log in his computer, sit some tables, and start playing. And he'd be brushing away the sleep from his eyes. Yeah, no yeah. shower. No, just get <laughs> right in, just right in, and then and then he'd just be there twelve hours later, still playing. Yeah, like, yeah. But with those hey, guys, he'd, he'd be on the phone, like arguing with his girlfriend, while like like floor tabling and just, just living his life not, all, on the do, grind. Let's not bring those calls up to Jimmy. Okay, <laughs> he, does, he deserves better than that. Um, by the way, you're gonna you're gonna see Jimmy. He's gonna be meeting up with us in Miami. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah. Awesome. It'll be, it'll be fun. Anyway, uh, Jamo, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for your thoughts on this. It was good getting your perspective and uh, I'll see you soon. Yep. Sounds good to see you. All right. Welcome back everyone. And we are here with our second guest today. We're taking a little peek into team Landon. We are joined by one of the coaches, if not the lead coach, I'm not exactly sure in the structure there, but one of the coaches for the Landon team, Kevin Rabichow, otherwise known as K-Rab or Crab, I guess, depending on who pronounces it. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, happy to talk about this today. We're going to we're gonna talk about everything. We, we have a lot of different questions here, the community prepared, uh, and I want to make sure that we get to a lot of these points, but I want to kind of break this up and I want to talk about the you know pre-concession, kind of what led up to things and all that type of stuff. So why don't you just kick us off by talking about at, at what point uh, at what point did you get involved in this uh, in terms of working with Landon? So I was involved pretty early. Um, I kind of, I was following, you know, your match with 
Dean Eggs pretty closely. And I forget the exact timeline of like when this match came about after the end of that one, but like pretty much right away when I saw uh, the offer going up, I was like trying to get into communication because I just thought it was a cool project to be working on and I wanted to be involved in coaching something like this. Um, so I reached out to them and, and it's escaping me who exactly I spoke to first, but like through a few different people, I guess I got involved and, and like pretty quickly there were, I don't know, seven or eight people who, who Landon was accumulating onto this team. Uh, so I guess this would have been like mid February if, if I remember right. Um, but this was, you know, this was after the, the challenge was like set, right? So I guess there's some people who know Landon, you know, more, more closely than I did um, at the time who were kind of there when he was like issuing the challenge and negotiating with Bill and whatnot. And then like a- after that point, when he started building his team, that's when I joined. That's actually interesting. So when I saw that happening online, I actually was watching those tweets as went down the negotiation negotiation process, because I think Bill's original plan was to bait me into something, giving him a bunch of odds. And then Landon just jumped in there, uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but with in terms of the negotiation for the, the handicap, there were backers involved because the speed at which it happened made it seem that it had to have been Landon just uni- unilaterally acting on that. But the backers then were already a part of this pre the offer or well, my, my understanding is like Landon book the thing. Like okay. my, my understanding is pretty much like Landon wanted this challenge. He saw an opportunity to, to make it happen on Twitter and it pretty much just happened. Okay. Um, and, and the team, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't really speak to the backers. Uh, I mean, I say this as if I wasn't a backer eventually, but um the, the people who were involved with Landon, like before any of this happened, like he was already being backed. He was working with people. Uh, they, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was like Landon's challenge. Yeah. Could, could you maybe explain a little bit the structure then? Because I think for people that might not be so familiar with, with the challenge format, they might not understand the team that goes behind it, but then it adds another layer when you also tack on the fact that you're, you, you have to sell or be staked for it or sell a significant portion of the action. So what was the behind the scenes sort of like in terms of backers, coaches, Landon, who was all involved that I guess you're at least at Liberty to say, and then additionally, what was that structure kind of like? Yeah. So this, I mean, what you're, what you're alluding to here, I think was like a pretty, like this was kind of in flux for a while. And this was something that I think like caused some problems down the road. Um, what I remember was like pretty early on uh, Landon's, you know, uh, I don't want to say angle, like his his goal was to get everyone involved with like incentive, right? So he he was aiming to build a team, which which I agreed with, like we at this point, you know, I'm kind of involved. So I'm speaking with him about this, like, uh, I think everyone understood that to make a team work in this environment, you want those team members to be like bought into the action so that like everyone's incentives are aligned everyone's spending time on something that they're like mutually going to benefit from and this is a this is a big factor i think because um landon as as has been kind of widely publicized already is is playing you know 20x the stakes he was playing like two days prior right um or he's at least planning to so a lot of action needs to be sold and the people who it's sold to and how much I think is quite important. Um, so I was, you know, brought in early and was just kind of told like, Hey, you know, you're, you're going to be part of this team. Like we want you coaching. Like how much do you want basically? Cause there was a lot to sell. I mean, <laughs> that's right. it's 200, 400. It's a huge match. Um, there's a lot of action to sell. And, you know, beyond that, like I wasn't, super involved in like, oh, this person's getting this piece or negotiating how much this person's putting in in exchange for what piece. But like what kind of happened over time was like people were just brought in who were interested in the project. They were told like, you know, there's there's action in it if you want to help. And like a lot of people got on board. Okay. So there was there was a good number of people involved then. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, there were. That's got to be a, a bit of a headache, I think, um, for, I guess, everyone just to deal with a lot of people, because I think once the challenge is booked, I, I know as the player and, and really as the coach, I think you'd want to be able to just focus on the action and focus on the game. Yeah. And um, maybe, you know, one of the 
reasons why you shouldn't be accepting these so quickly or, or accepting stakes that are way higher than your bankroll without having things really squared away beforehand is the additional logistics and the problems that can create. Um, but um, mo moving on from there, I, I want to ask, uh, so what was the kind of game plan like in terms of the coaching regimen? What was your, what was your plan? You're taking someone that's obviously a, a smart kid. I've played him a little bit before the, before things happened. And uh, he, he was at least reasonable. I, I, I know that he's done well, I think at mid stakes online, maybe even high stakes online. I'm not totally sure what, what, what his full range was, but what's the game plan to try and take someone that's at that point and build them up to be the player that could actually win versus, uh, you know, win at this clip. But what's that process like? Yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to approach this and I guess I, I, I should clarify, like you, you kind of said at the beginning, you weren't sure if I was like one of the coaches or head coach or whatever. Like, I think, you know, early on, early on the coaching was my responsibility. Um, and over time, like, roles kind of shifted and we we found ways to bring more people in to kind of assist in the coaching process and that's kind of a story for later but just to be clear like at early stages I'm basically deciding what we're working on um so early on I was you know of the impression that he, he's coming from six max right so I think like the very basics that need to be ironed out is what kind of preflop strategy does he need to learn and get very proficient at how uh and like, once we feel good about that preflop strategy, uh, taking say like all the basic spots, like single raise pot, three bet pot, four bet pot, and putting together like a, a sort of like training pack that's gonna get him reasonably proficient at understanding how flops work, understanding how like the most common situations in the game work within, the, within that strategy. Um, so my goal was to have him like feeling pretty comfortable with that in the first month. Um, and I thought that was like a reasonable time frame to, um, yeah, I mean, learn it. I say learning preflop, like there's not that many ranges and heads up. Um, so, you say that, you say <laughs> that, but, but you can get in the weeds if you want to, but sure. I, yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah. And this, it was agreed upon like preflop mm -hmm. charts are allowed, you know, the whole thing. So like the, the game plan for the first month was just like, let's get really reasonably competent at the basics. Uh, or what I would consider the basics. And then once we've kind of hit that like minimum threshold, we just want to play a ton because up to this point, he'd played so little heads up, like maybe none. I, I don't even remember if he's played like a single hand of like true heads up format prior to issuing this challenge, <laughs> which is pretty wild when you think about it. Um, but he's played a I, ton I, of six max hands. I think, I think I played him before he issued this. Did he? So I, I had played him a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's like, yeah, there's just like a lot of habits that you develop in six max that don't carry over very well. So it was like pretty important in my mind that he just plays volume. Um, so like step one, learn the basic theory. Step two, play a bunch of volume. And then once he's kind of a, like got sort of into the swing of like playing a bunch of heads up, we've got some stats to work with. And now we can start thinking about, okay, like where are you leaking? What kind of needs the most adjusting? I mean, the, the goal was just to build him up into a pretty sound fundamental heads up player pre-challenge. And then once the challenge starts, it's a different ball game, right? Like once the challenge starts, we're, we're playing Bill and we've got to figure out how Bill's playing and we have to adjust right. to that. Were, were there were there certain parts of the training regimen that you had that, that shifted over the period? So for example, maybe early on, it was more guided lesson plans from you. And then as you went through, did you have him running more drills and um, maybe... What was that process like? How did it shift over the course of that training period? Because you did have a few months, right? So I imagine that you could tailor it um, to sort of the to it. I guess you could tailor it based on sort of where he's at and and how he's developing. Yeah. So I would say like I'm trying to remember my timelines here, but um, let's say like a month into preparation, I would say he he shifted from. Well, I, I think he got into playing like pretty quickly. I guess I'll start by saying that. Like, I think the the training method that like spoke to Landon the most was just like grinding hands, right? Like he he wanted to be at the tables. Um, and that that was made clear to me pretty early. So he he was the most engaged when he was able to play sessions and then review those sessions. So I think like early on, it was it was obvious to me that we needed to sort of shift 
not away from like a theoretical approach, but just make sure that like actual hands were involved in, in what he was doing day to day, because it was going to be hard to keep him engaged if that wasn't happening. Um, so I think the, the training pretty quickly, it, it might've even been earlier than a month in, like pretty quickly moved towards like, he's going to battle some people on ACR. He's going to battle some people on WSOP. We're just going to get together a sample. We'll address the theory that he's struggling with. Right. Um, so that was, that was probably like shift number one that I thought was, was important. Um, and then, you know, any future shifts beyond that were more a product of like bringing in new coaches or bringing in more resources or kind of changing priorities as, yeah, as the, as the team sort of expanded, that was, uh, that was strategic shift number two. There's, there's a lot of great things to get into here. It's hard to pick what direction, but I want to start with yeah. this. Do you feel he was putting in enough time on the theory side? Do you, do you feel he was putting enough time into the studying? One of the things that I saw throughout the training, the period building up to this, I, I saw Landon posting a lot on Twitter and going to play live tournaments and it seemed from the outside, like he wasn't taking it maybe as seriously as he should have been. Do you think that that's true? Or do you think that he was actually spending a lot of time and maybe he was just using his, his, his small amount of spare time to, to do those things? How did you feel about the amount of time he spent preparing? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I want to address this, like pointing out that this is sort of like in, in retrospect, I think in, in that early time, I wasn't like, I wasn't checking in with him like on a daily basis and and like seeing how much theory work he was putting in. I think in retrospect, we would like all agree that he didn't put in enough theory time at these stages, like in the early in the early days. Um, and the time that he was like, yeah, the time that he was putting in was primarily at the tables. Um, was which he like running, as a sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but was he running his own sims? Yeah, yeah, he runs okay. his own sims. Okay. Uh, well, sorry, like not. Um, he wasn't like structurally like running the Sims for, for like our training or whatever. That was my responsibility. Right. Um, but like if he was playing a session and then doing like post uh, mm -hmm. analysis, he would run his own Sims. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Carry yeah. on. Sorry. So like, uh, yeah. So I think what you're getting at, which is important to talk about here is, is that like the time spent in those, in those early months, uh, were like not closely managed, uh, is the way that I would put it. And like, part of that falls on me and part of that falls on like everyone who was on the team. And then like, of course, as you know, Landon's willing to accept, like a lot of that falls on him. Uh, I think he kind of like fell into what I would call like, you know, old habits, which were just, the way that he learned the game like up until this challenge was just like kind of the way that he was naturally proceeding without like a lot of guidance right so that was just hitting the tables like that was just like it like you said he was playing like six max playing tournaments whatever like at, at some point like the team kind of gathers around and says like hey this is a distraction like let's only play heads up and he did it um but that wasn't addressed until yeah i mean way too late right like early may something like that. Oh, okay. So he had several months that kind of went by like that. It, yeah. I mean, like what, as, as I like recount the time that we spent, you know, from like mid February to mid May, it's like kind of blurry. And that's, I mean, sort of just because like not, not any team member in particular at that stage, I think had like the, the leadership position of, Hey, you know, the challenge starts on this day there's this many hours of work that that needs to be done every single day along the way. And like, there were also wasn't someone who was like, kind of side by side with Landon, like checking in on a daily basis saying like, hey, did you hit those targets today? Hey, did you hit those targets yesterday or whatever? And that's like, that's just kind of an overall, you know, team failure, I think. I think that you can certainly put some responsibility on the group but I also think that the, the main responsibility here, it falls in land. And I'm not saying that he's avoiding that responsibility. Yeah. I think with the moment that this got accepted, it needed to be the focus. You're doing something in a very public setting. This would be a huge victory for you. Even if you don't have a ton of the action, just in terms of for furthering your career and getting your name out there and, you know, essentially becoming a successful young poker player, this is a good opportunity to really kind of take a, a step or two up. And I, I think maybe, maybe, there was a little too much of thinking Bill's just going to be terrible. So we can just focus elsewhere. 
Um, whereas, you know, Bill, Bill was studying very hard. I know Bill was studying because he was playing me, you know, he was playing me all the time, running Sims, messaging me about the Sims. He was yeah. really taking it quite seriously. So maybe that played a role. I, and I'm not trying to, to over, um, you know, over hammer this point home, but yeah, it seems like maybe, maybe, maybe having someone that would have been managing the time would have been much better, but you also kind of have to want it yourself. Yeah. I think it's, like I said, it's really easy to talk this way about it in, in, in hindsight, because I mean, first of all, I've like talked at length with the team and with Landon at this point about like what went wrong and kind of how we see things. Um, and this was a big one, just like early time management, I, like I, no, no one involved, I think really took ownership of just saying like, we've got to put in, you know, six, eight, 10 hours a day just for this challenge. And it's going to happen in this way. I also think uh, I, so actually just to say this for a moment, I have a ton of respect for your game. I think that you are a really good heads up player. Out of all the people I practice against, I, I think I've said this before, I thought you were the strongest player I played. I think you Appreciate are that, yeah. extremely qualified to coach. You have obviously a lot of experience coaching. I, I think I, I basically, I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to sell Clicker and Frab short because obviously they're my crew. They worked with me on my challenge. But what happened to get them involved? Because in my book, I would rather have a unified team and the coaching front because some people don't really realize this about heads up, but they tend to be little clicks or groups or crews. And it, it feels a little weird to merge two kind of together in a coaching atmosphere because, yeah, I mean, obviously you're all super qualified. In fact, if I had to pick three of the most qualified people, I'd probably pick you three. Those are fantastic options. But did you feel maybe once other people were coming in that maybe you don't work so close with that it creates a little bit of a weird atmosphere for learning? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, so yeah, I, I sort of agree with your sentiment here, which is like, like choosing a, a singular head coach among any of the three of us and like only having that person responsible for kind of everything is probably better than having all three of us kind of trying to collaborate and, you know, splitting up responsibilities and trying to like play off of each other. Um, we ended up choosing the latter option with, you know, for better or for worse. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of reasons that went into that as well. Like at no point, at, at least to my knowledge, was the expectation that I was going to come in and work with Landon, you know, six hours a day from February to, to June, right? There was kind of, I think, from the start, this like, you know, a bit of a lack of vision about like what the coaches, like how, how much involvement do I want from my coaches and what does it look like and how are we compensating them for that time and, and all of this, right? Um, so when we bring it, you know, and again, I forget exactly. I remember that, that Frab was brought in quite late. Um, I don't remember exactly when clicker was, was added think, to the I team. I think it was the week or two before is my understanding. I think it was oh, right okay. there at the end. So I... pretty, yeah. So like, we're probably talking early May and then like, you know, mid May or something like this. Um, and, and at this point, I think there were a bunch of things like one, you know, we still had action available. Um, we still had time time gaps to fill which is like you know, you know it's a bit yeah I, whatever i don't want to get sidetracked um there there was action to sell there were hours to fill in the day like there was work to be done and and i think at this point we're all starting to realize that right like and again that like lack of early urgency but like there was a ton of urgency in may of course i mean it's you know three weeks away or whatever um, and a bunch of details that weren't confirmed before May got confirmed in May about the challenge. So, you know, now it's like, okay, who's going to, you know, who's going to do like post-session reviews directly with Landon? Well, it's like, well, I'm doing all the prep work and I'm organizing and I'm coordinating the strategies, like probably not me. So it's like, okay, let's get Clicker to do that or whatever. And then like, you know, a, a week or two later, it's like, hey, you know, mid, mid match, like once we get the challenge rolling, like who's going to be in there day after day, like analyzing the data and like coming up with counters and coming up with, with like analysis that Landon needs to be adjusting. And, and it's like, uh, well, I don't really have time for that. And you don't really have time for that. So like, let's get Frab to do it. Um, so that was, that was sort of how it felt like it came together. And like, obviously, as, as you pointed out, just like not really the right way to go about it. I wanted to ask one last question here before we jump in and talk about the, the once things actually started rolling, but what, how did you feel going in? So, so night before you're going to bed, you're thinking about, all right, this is going to start tomorrow. 
How are you feeling about Landon's game? Did you think, did you think he was at a place that was really, that was good enough to get it done? Were you excited? Did you worry? How were you feeling right before they, we set, we set action and set the, the challenge off? That's a, that's a good question. And I, I mean, I remember <laughs> like, to be honest, what I remember about that day is I remember wondering if they were even going to play. I remember wondering if like, like it still felt, there were so many things that like almost fell apart, like logistically speaking, not just from our team, like literally with like ACR and shit. Like there were, there was just so many little details that kept going wrong. Like day after day, I was like, are they even going to play a session today? It was very distracting. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think in spite of what I'm saying, like I still felt that Landon was like a strong player. And when we spoke about the game, I felt that he was like very capable of, you know, walking in, sizing up an opponent and like whatever it was that we decided he needed to do, he could get done. Um, like I've, I've, I've heard, I've heard Nick call him, uh, Nick Shulman. I've heard him call Landon a gamer a lot, like the type of person who just like, who just shows up and like is amazing. And I definitely felt like when I would watch him play actual sessions, I would feel that same kind of energy. And I was like pretty excited to watch him play. Um, but at the same time, kind of stressed because at that point we're really just sweating, like how good is Bill going to be? Right. That was, I think that was like a big focus at that point was just like, like, okay, we've, we've done what we can, like we're here on day one, like how good is Bill going to be? And like, what do we need to do? What, what were Landon's stats? Like, you know, not specifically, but were, were the stats good? He was hitting good frequencies. He was playing the ranges preflop correctly. He was, cause I'm sure by that point you got, he had a bunch of hands to look at, right. That you had probably analyzed. Yeah, I think, uh, so what I remember of his stats, like pre, there was a, a a bit of a problem, like pre-challenge, a lot of the volume he was able to get in, in like April and May was on WSOP. So like, we didn't have, right. we didn't have perfect stats on everything, but what, what I remember from the stats that were like two or three points of concern that I had noted going in, uh, yeah, like leading into May or whatever. And that's what, that's what he was focusing on in, in hand review. And it really wasn't wasn't anything like super major maybe he was like a you know uh under aggressive on turns in single raise pots uh and that's just like yeah like stuff that i felt was a relatively easy fix i guess right. is is what i would say okay so once the challenge gets rolling obviously you guys start off it's kind of swingy but i'd say landon does probably pretty well overall in the first four or five sessions, not too big in either direction, but he gets a bit of a lead going. Um, what were your sort of impressions of Bill's game at that point? And, and how did you feel it was going, let's say in the first half of what was actually played? Um, so I think that early on our snap reaction was that we had a good shot uh, based on Bill's game. I, I think in the first few days, we saw a lot of mistakes. Um, we saw some stuff that was like, you know, you don't want to jump to conclusions about like individual hands, but we saw a couple of individual hands that were just like, wow, like this, you know, this could be a great situation for us. A any that just spring to mind right, right up, that you can. <laughs> uh, if I can't remember if this was session one or session two, but there was like the, the ace five suited three bet pot where, where Bill bets, uh, I think, oh man, I don't even remember the board now. But I think he he has second pair with ace five suited in a three bet pot. He like c bets two thirds, gets called, turns like a, a four. I want to say it was like queen eight five four or something like that. Uh, and he just like full pots the turn. Mm. Uh, no, I think yeah, I think it was king high because I think Landon had king nine. And like yeah, and and so they just it, like get it. it, it they just get it in on yeah. the turn. It was just like a hand that should be zero percent, and it was one of those things that was like. Wow, if this like if this is going to show up even semi regular, like you know, we don't even need to be that proficient. We just kind of need to like, you know, stay in our lane, like sort of find you know the the approximate um, spots where Bill's like not playing that great, and just like increase the aggression a little bit in those spots, and like the money will just kind of show up. Um, but those those hands kind of turned out to be like more few and far between. I think as as the sessions went on, he really nipped that in the bud speaking of bill because he he used to do that kind of stuff all the time and he still has those moments but the frequency of that kind of hand went went down a lot yeah. uh, over the last year of playing bill or whatever i've played him so yeah. that, not not surprised to see that though because 
that's that's going to be in there. That's why there's the nine big one handicap, right? It's, you need you and need like, some of those were, parts. There were other thing. There were other things showed up showing up in the stats early on on Bill's side that we thought like, wow, this is great. Like this, like if if this holds up for even a little bit of time, it's like a huge source of of edge. Um, like what's an but, example of one of those? I think in the in the first and it, and it very well just could have been like card distribution, but I think for the first like three K hands, his four bet pre was like two percent. It was okay. like way. It was like multiple standard deviations below like the the correct number um but again like like could have been an anomaly we never really saw showdowns that indicated like like we didn't see him like flat and kings to a three bet or something so like we is a bit unconfirmed um and then there was like you know the spots that i like to look for and typically which which i'm sure you have you know, you kind of gravitate towards when you're analyzing a heads up opponent is like, where do they fold too much in like a common situation? Um, and I think he was folding to turn probe like a ton or early days, like 60, 60 something. Um, Versus two thirds pot type turn probe or? Yeah, like Landon's, Landon's sizes there were all under pot or he was using pot in some on some boards and he was using okay. two thirds on other boards, but yeah, he wasn't doing any overbetting in that node. He was just folding like 60 or something. Yeah, that's that's pretty brutal for you when you're in the small blind because not only do you get owned when you check back, but then it also says, hey, what's going on with the C-bets? They're probably pretty strong. So then you can get out of the way a little bit more easily in some fringe spots, maybe pick your check race spots a little more carefully. Um, so you actually kind of lose on both sides when when you have leaks like that. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm sure you guys were, were thrilled to see that. Did Bill start to patch those? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Um, I would say this was like, like a, a reasonable, you know, head, heading towards more like the decision to concede the match. Like this, this was kind of a big part of that decision, I think was like, yeah, there were, there were obviously problems in our camp. Um, but we were also seeing kind of like the low hanging fruit just kind of close up. Um, there were some other things with regards to like how he responded to certain bet sizes or like the preflop thing that I mentioned or, or just like folding frequencies. And it just like started to get better. And there were like spots where he wasn't bluffing at first and then he just like started bluffing them. So, you know, like just kind of the easiest stuff that you would think like, like if you're going to get nine big blinds comfortably, which realistically means we're trying to make like 15 big blinds. Like if we're going to win by like 15 big blinds, like we need low hanging fruit, right? We can't, right. we can't rely on like kind of feely, you know, maybe I know what he's doing when we get to this node kind of stuff. Like we need big leaks. Um, and, and those were disappearing pretty quick. That had to be pretty, pretty scary times. And I imagine <laughs> it didn't help when he had the, there was one or two sessions where he lost a lot of buy-ins, I think. And it wasn't, I say a lot, I, okay, Nobody I had a bit. There weren't big swings. I, like, I have to just take a step back here, right? Yeah. You look at that graph and you think, "Wow, swings!" But then you realize there are not that many buy-ins. I mean, from from the peak where he was at until around when he conceded, I think he went on a six buy-in downswing or something. That's not particularly massive. Yeah, and, and and I think I think there's like a bit of the perception that this was just like a like a snap reaction kind of thing, right? That like. The match started like taking a turn for the worse and we just like pulled the plug and it wasn't really like that it was just like all the things that we were counting on working in our favor were like trending away and it wasn't even really the results necessarily it was just like like we we had no misconceptions about how hard it was to win nine big blinds per hundred for 20k hands um a lot of things needed to go right like landon needed to be really sharp bill needed to be pretty sloppy and like right away, we just weren't really where we wanted to be. Right. That, that makes sense. From the outside, though, this was shocking. Yeah. I, I, I had actually messaged to Bill. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to cast your next your next game or your next match. Uh, what day are you guys playing? I'm going to I'm going to do a stream and commentate it. And he's like, I think we're playing on Monday. And so I was I was I, I didn't even think that there was a remote possibility of this because it, it, from the outside, okay, he loses one or two sessions, and then now he's only two, two and a half buy-ins under where he needs to be, and he's throwing in the towel. It, it was pretty shocking, I, I think. What, yeah. what, what was, what was the process that led up to that decision? I mean, who was concerned? What, what, what was that? What was that process like? So, I mean, like, like if we're going, 
if we're going back to sort of where like concern originated, I think we're going back to when like Clicker and Frab joined the crew. Because I think like once we got sort of fresh eyes on the challenge, there were there were people who were starting to like express concern that we just weren't where we needed to be. And well, I mean, basically them like, and I mean, it was, yeah, the whole thing was like kind of a mess at that point, but like basically, like I said, we're trying to sell action. We're trying to like get kind of more coaches involved to, to, um, to fill the hours that we felt that we needed to put in. And there was even more coaches. No, no. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about clicker and right. Frab. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> so, so when they, so they came in and like, and took a big chunk of action at first and, uh, yeah, just like started committing to some work. And then when they started doing the work, they were like, they were just not happy uh, with the situation. They felt that we just like weren't really where they needed to be. And they, act, they actually ended up selling off a big piece, which I think was like pretty shitty for team morale. And just like generally did not further the whole like uh, incentives thing that we were talking about before, where like the people who are kind of most vital to success are like the most heavily invested that like ended up not being the case. Um, they were still involved. They still, you know, did coaching, obviously not saying that they like didn't do the work that they said they were going to do. Um, but when that, uh, I'm like getting way sidetracked now. Uh, but when that started to like, when, the, when they started to express interest in like reducing their piece, we like already knew that there were kind of problems with like our potential to beat the nine big blind spot. Right. Right. Uh, not that there was ever any like doubt about this, but it's, it just starts to like shift around where it's like, are we, are we looking to be the nine big blind spot? Because we actually like believe that we're doing well and we can like bring Landon to a better place month over month, or are we just like praying that Bill's going to show up and be sloppy? And like, it, so like immediately that tone was kind of being taken just like, yeah, I mean, basically from day one of, of the challenge, um, and then you go forward, you know, two weeks in or whatever, like, yeah, the results were fine. We felt okay. But like, as far as making week over week progress on like Landon moving towards, you know, just like a crusher who's going to maintain his edge, just like we kind of stayed baseline, I guess is what I would say. Like, yeah, we, we like did study and felt fine about the hands, but we didn't feel like the edge was growing. We didn't feel like we were like, gaining ground in any particular way. We just kind of felt like we were still there, like hoping that Bill would stay terrible. Um, so a, a, yeah, like a big part of the decision. And, and we did have, you know, like Landon's doing hand review constantly. And like kind of every time I think someone who wasn't like involved from the very beginning took a look at stuff, they were just like, yeah, we're not, you're not doing that. Great. Like this isn't a nine big blind kind of situation right so i think this that whole environment was like hanging over the backers heads from day one and it you know unless we came out and just like went on a heater and got like a bunch of free money i think the backers were like pretty they were just pretty quick to want to pull the plug um i don't think landon was aware of that either but so the backers um is this at, at the point where frab and clicker expressed concerns at that point did the backers want to pull the plug or was that happening i mean i assume you guys all had action too, right? So how many backer, I mean, I don't even, how many people are we talking about? I'm not sure what can be. Uh, it, we're not talking about like a huge number of people. It's not like this was a, a crowd sale with like half percent shares or whatever. Like okay. every, everyone involved was, was playing for size. Um, but the, I think the reason that people started buying in was changing, right? It was, it was shifting away from like, we're putting money down on our horse to like, we're placing a prop bet about whether or not Bill's going to show up and be decent. Right. So like, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't even, I don't know every backer personally and I don't want to just like throw sure, random names of course, out. Yeah, but of course. yeah, the, the, the action essentially moved like away from the people who were involved to people who were not involved. Not a good sign. Not a good sign. Yeah. So what was the day like leading up to the concession? What, what exactly happened? What was the final straw? Uh, who who had sort of the last? What was? Well, can you walk us through what what happened here? Yeah, well, please. I mean, as as juicy and as in detail as you're allowed to go would be, would be preferable. 
I mean, it's, yeah, I, don't, I, I hate to disappoint a, a good audience, but like the, it was just like another, so like every couple days, like, you know, all of us who are working with Landon would have like meetings, right? Like Landon's not on every single call, which I think is just normal for like a coaching staff to sort of like talk about um, strategic changes that they want to make or like logistical decisions or whatever. And there, uh, I think that like the backers for the most part, I mean, some of all of the coaches still, you know, myself included, we have, we have pieces. Um, so we controlled like a lot of the financial interests, but also, like I said, the, the kind of outside backers who didn't, who weren't involved, were just like trusting our judgment on, on everything. Um, so I think there was just like, I mean, I was, I was telling you before this call, I've been in the middle of moving. So I was like pretty, <laughs> it was, I was a bit frantic to be like, not at my normal desk, not even able to join every call. And like, in the meantime, we're discussing forfeiting a challenge that I've just like spent the last four months working on. I'm, I'm like pretty unhappy, but at the same time, like I get it. I, it's a business decision. Like, so there were just a bunch of calls between, you know, the coaches and the backers and just kind of like, um, a, a general sentiment being shared of like, like, the opportunities are getting worse. This is coming from like, you know, FRAB analyzing stuff. Um, and like the, the progress, you know, say clicker or whoever else, like working kind of on, on day-to-day -day theory, just saying like, I, I don't think we're like making leaps and bounds here. And, and this wasn't like a new conversation. It was just new to be talking about like pulling the plug as a result. Did you want to pull the plug? No. <laughs> but but I understand why we did like and it's funny because I actually I actually had a decent piece but the the competitive part of me and like the coach who who kind of felt that I was like I was just like very emotionally invested in this challenge and yeah. I think I think to some extent that was like stopping me from making just like a you know a pretty difficult smart business decision but it just like wasn't even on my radar. Um, it was brought to my radar and I understand why. And I was convinced that it was the best decision, but like, if it was just me, I would have just, I would have just kept playing. Do you feel there's a little bit of honor too in keeping and continuing to play? I, I understand that it, it may have been the best decision monetarily, but I also think if we're going to have challenges where the moment someone thinks they're losing, they just quit what what does that what what does that say for making this some kind of spectacle and what does that say for the people that are going to bet on it right oh hey i'm betting on my guy but i hope he doesn't have a few sessions where it looks like he's not winning you know isn't that sort of like the sort of i i feel the mentality going into this has to be we're playing for the long run and it's not just we're going to quit the moment that things look like they're not going our way yeah. And I, and I mean, I think this just goes back to like what I talked about being a problem on day one was like the, the, in the, in the pieces of this chat, like it's a big, pro like, I don't, I don't think I can emphasize enough, like how problematic it is to like make the team structure work when not everyone is like risking a substantial amount. Um, because like no like nobody feels that urgency right like nobody nobody just takes it upon themselves to say like i need to to win this thing or else i cannot like well that's afford. landon's that's landon's job really yeah but i'm just i'm i'm saying it like generally because it was true of almost everyone involved that like nobody was all in so like it, it was uh um yeah it was it was difficult to feel that like the team was really all in on like playing through and and thinking long run. And like, it did end up just being like kind of a, a, a cold business decision. Um, but I agree with you. It's like, it's not the way to go. I just think it was like the unfortunate result of, of Landon not being able to afford to play it himself. Like I'm, I'm sure if he could afford to play this himself, he would have been as all in as possible. He would have never quit. Like he, I mean, we couldn't even, yeah. We, we couldn't have him on the call when we were talking about quitting because we we knew he was just going to refuse right did did you actually talk to him or, or what were his thoughts when you told him the decision you guys had made how did he feel did he want to quit no he didn't want to quit uh but he but he trusts us like 
he just he just said okay like yeah he wasn't happy about it yeah i mean that sucks and 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 also i think if i was in his shoes and i needed a lot of backing for this i would have really tried to make a caveat of getting a piece that you know he essentially gets to decide when when he quits because and maybe it's it maybe it's different here because there's not a lot of people who want action so you don't get that luxury but if i was going to enter something where i had to sell 90 or whatever percent uh, he ended up had to sell i would be i would ensure that i, I don't just look like an idiot if other people just decide oh we don't want to do this anymore and then i'm left holding the bag i i i would have made part of it hey i get to decide when this is over otherwise i'm not going to sell you the piece and i think that would be a kind of reasonable ask for a contestant in a format like this when it's going to be a public thing it's going to be a spectacle there are going to be people betting on it um i think i think that it would be a, a quite reasonable ask to be honest yeah yeah i mean like like i feel for landon because i think at the end of the day he just like he didn't know that much about what could go wrong and just like was fired up to play and wanted to put together a team of people who were fired up and just like, yeah, this just like, wasn't, wasn't a strong suit. Right. I mean, he's not like a, yeah, not like a business decision maker not like a management expert or anything. Like there's, there's just all these elements to like this sort of challenge that are not related to poker skill whatsoever. And like that, like the Unfortunately, like the, those were like all the things that we got wrong. Like the original negotiation for terms. <laughs> like the original <laughs> negotiation, yes. Yeah. What did you think about the nine big blinds when you first heard about it? So like, I mean, I wanted to be on board. So obviously I thought it was doable, right? Um, I I thought it was a big, I thought it was a big ask, but I was also like looking at it. If If you asked me, after I saw like the full structure of the challenge, I would have said like, this is going to be fucking hard. Um, but when it was first presented, it was just like 20 K hands against Bill Perkins, like heads up, no limit. I'm in. Get to- <laughs> I was like, great. Like, I remember, I remember the good old days. Like I remember when, you know, whales at heads up lost 40 big blinds. Like let's just get half of that. And we cruise to victory. Um, and there were, and like Landon wasn't even like to my memory, he wasn't even the only one who was trying to book this challenge. So like there were, there was even like a bit of a, like a bidding war or like a, or at least like a bit of a scramble to just like try and be the one who gets to play. Hmm. So like it, you know, it, it wasn't as like, yeah, it, it wasn't as much of like, you know, Bill texts Landon and says like, Hey, I want to battle you heads up. Like how much will you give me? And Landon's like 20 big blinds, no problem (laughs) or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there was like more of a scramble to it, but there yeah, was a- I was like, I was okay. W- I was okay with it. And then like, once all the terms kind of fell into place, I was like, yeah, this is going to be very difficult. What, what were some of the other terms that you felt made it difficult? Uh, June 1st start date was a, was a big one. So this, this was in February, right? Right. Um, I think June 1st was, was negotiated a couple days after uh, the spot was negotiated. And that's just like, that's just huge. I mean, the, like the amount of time you give to prepare can only favor the, I mean, I'm going to call Bill the less experienced player, which is ironic, but I mean, yeah, like the time to prepare does not favor Landon uh, in, in this challenge. So that I, I didn't know how long he was going to get. And then like one day it's just, oh yeah, it's June 1st. And I'm like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> I guess I- it's June 1st. Uh, and there were there were other little details that I don't think were as significant. Like you know, we we agreed to the use of preflop charts. Um, yeah, matters a lot. I mean, preflop is like the difference between memorizing preflop and just like looking at it, especially when you know preflop isn't just oh, there's one preflop solution to learn. Like we could choose to come out and start three xing the button or we could choose to come out and start limping and he needs to be able to learn how to counter that and if you allow preflop charts like all of those counters are just kind of pointless like or at least you know less effective right yeah definitely if you allow the charts but it also depends on what they prep and it depends on i there were some kind of weird rules here too right limping wasn't allowed i think limping wasn't allowed which is fine but it's just weird to I have not seen someone say that beforehand that we're not going to allow limping. 
I, I do feel, I mean, I wasn't part of these discussions, but I do feel a lot of the like format and structure was just like, oh yeah, I want to do like the Doug Dean eggs challenge, but against Bill, you know, like, and, and I think a lot of those details were just like a foregone conclusion when in reality they matter a lot. Well, then why did they reset stacks? Oh man, that was, yeah, I forgot about that detail. Uh, the, the original discussion, well, again, uh, I say discussion, the, the rule that I understood was that 300 big blinds effective, you break stacks. The rule that we found out it was on day one of the match, however that transpired, I'm not sure, was 300 big blinds sitting in anyone's stack, you can reset, which is a massive difference, of course. Yeah, of course. And and that was like, I mean, I personally was blindsided by that on, on June 2nd. I was I was under the impression 300 effective break stacks. What was the original wording like when it was agreed upon? Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> chalk this up to like another one of just like mismanagement situations. Like this was this was mostly handled directly between Landon and Bill via text. I'm pretty sure, and like okay. not really not really like firm in any sort of document or anything. Yeah, but like we we desperately needed that for sure. It seems kind of clear cut if they had been texting about it though. I'm sure someone had either said reset it at 300 or someone said effective. I feel that that had to be um, yeah. in there, but that's, that would be a, that would be something I would really fight for if I'm giving nine, because yeah. I, I want stacks to be as deep as possible. If I have to give up edge, because then it lets me have more opportunity to win extremely large pots and really have big edge in some of those deeper pot situations. I would be, you know, you give an extreme example, no one's going to be giving nine big blinds if you're playing 10 big blind poker, right? Right. obviously. So, right. you know, if you're playing thousand big blind poker and nine big blinds, not so much to give up, right? It, it, it can become a lot better for you when yeah. there's more play and there's more decisions and thus more opportunity for mistakes and edge and everything else. So I, I would have fought pretty aggressively to keep the same format than if you guys were trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, like Land, Landon has expressed to me and, and also publicly at length, like how much, how much he's learned from this. And I don't think what he means is like, I've learned how to play heads up, no limit better. I think what he means is like, <laughs> no, like <laughs> that's, that's Ouch. taken the wrong, that's taken the wrong way, but you know what I mean? Like he, the, the life lessons that he's talking about taking away is like why it's important to like structure, like why it's important to plan out like this aspect of the challenge and like why it's important to think about the potential fallout of this detail and like why it's important to design your team or like, you know, make your arrangements in this certain way. Cause like, I think at the end of the day, he just wanted to sit down and play poker and he just like, like everything else was secondary. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And I would agree with that. I also think Bill's team now, I know there's a lot of trolling about hybrid poker and obviously they coach Negrano. He didn't fare so well, but the thing about those guys is that they have good stuff compared to what most people are doing. And when I played Negrano and I went through his stats, um, Negrano played pretty well pre-flop. He played pretty accurate pre-flop and he played reasonable sizes post-flop uh, the first couple of weeks he wasn't. But then once he, once he had that in, he was playing reasonable post-flop. So I think it kind of helps Bill that he has a team that has not only, it's not only smaller, it's going to be focused on Bill specifically. And then also they just did a challenge. So they have just done the full A to Z thing together. And even though they lost, it's going to give them an advantage in, okay, what things went well for us and didn't, how would we change this? How would we structure this differently? Uh, there's, there's a, there's an advantage to just having them been through that process beforehand that I think, that I think probably helped him some. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Like I, I've heard, I've heard a lot, or I've gotten the question a lot, like, about Landon putting in the hours, right? And like, if if we just talk about like how many hours did Landon sit down and like focus on this challenge compared to how many hours did Bill sit down and focus on this challenge? Like Landon's probably like 2X or 3X or something, but none of it was like structured like A to Z, as you said, with like the plan of, we know how to go from like where I'm starting to where I need to be in this challenge. We have like everything mapped out. Like so many of those hours were spent either playing or communicating with one of us saying like, Hey, I think we should do this thing differently. Or like, Hey, logistically, like, what do we want to do here? And like, it's just a ton of burned hours on stuff that they already had figured out. So like, yeah. I, I think that was a huge edge for them. Definitely. I, I think Bill had a little bit of a different take on this. I don't want to misquote him, but I think he actually feels he's probably studied more 
I, I really don't want to be misquoting him because I forget his exact if, words, but um, I mean, I know he worked really hard and studied. He, he spent a, a, a very, a very good amount of time working on his game and improving and working with his team. And um, so he took it super seriously too. I, I think not having to sink time into those things that you're talking about though, had to be, you know, just a massive edge for Bill. Yeah, that's fair. And, and, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume how much time that Bill spent. Like you, you would know better than I would how many hours that they put in, but yeah, like hundred percent. It's just a lot of wasted hours. Absolutely. So I, I want to just bring this up for a moment. There was some leaked discord logs that caused quite a stir the other day. Yeah. Um, so I think for some people, there's a little bit of a misconception that group has a couple hundred members. I, for some reason, the way that it was brought up, it was, it was a tiny little group of you know the way it's the way that oh, it's, it really? it's talked about is like it's a small little um little boutique group with a few guys i'm in that group uh, tons of people are in that it's it's got about 200 members i i, I think um so interesting Cl it, clicker told it, me 10 or 20 but i mean i'd yeah. have to i'd have to look it up i i think it's i think yeah. it's 200 the, the the point is it's in the plo matrix uh the plo matrix discord Anyway, the point is, I, I, I think if Clicker didn't want those things to be public, I'm not, and, and I'm not letting JMO off the hook by any stretch of the imagination. He, he shouldn't just be blasting other people's images that sent to him. But it's kind of already in the vicinity of a public forum. I mean, is it that different than going to two plus two and posting something when, when we're talking about this scope? And when you post those things, do, don't you kind of feel there's a pretty good chance this stuff? I, I don't know. I, I'm. It's obviously in a gray area, and I'm not absolving anyone. But um, regardless, getting back to the comments, they were obviously quite harsh and angry. Did you yep. read what Clicker had to say about this challenge? Yep. What, what were your thoughts on those comments? Yeah, like, yeah. So again, I don't, I don't necessarily want to comment on like how, like whether or not that should be public or private, whatever. Like the, the bottom line is he like said a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff when he was angry about Landon that like probably you shouldn't say about your teammate. Um, I think it was like, yeah, I think it was an overreaction to say the least. Like I, I know that there was definitely some like pent up tension because like, you know, clicker, I mean, bottom line, like he's not the most experienced coach. So I think like he would, he would kind of like come with his stuff that works for him and he would like, you know, bring it to Landon and maybe they sit down and it just like doesn't work. Right. And like, he's just on tilt like right away. And, and I get that. Like, it's frustrating to like, feel like you understand everything and like not be able to get the other person to like absorb it back. And I'm not saying that this is like a hundred percent on his, like his failure or Landon's failure. I just think that like, it's unfair to like call out your teammate and say like, Hey, you suck. And like, this is your fault or whatever. And I think he's already kind of, I mean, they've, they've spoken since that was leaked and I, I think clicker already tweeted some stuff like I, th I think he recognizes that that was like out of line um yeah it was like it, it was frustrating and it, it's not because I thought it was like you know uh out of out of nowhere I just thought it was it's just like not good form to like call out your teammate and take and just kind of like put the responsibility on them when you know you're like you're involved too yeah it, re it reflects on you as well which is and maybe part of it is a defense mechanism where he's trying to make it not his fault or whatever. But if you're if you're involved, then obviously it reflects back on you. And I mean, the, the thing about the thing about um, Clicker uh, is that everyone talks about how young Landon is. Clicker is two years younger than Landon. You know, these 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 kids are they're yeah. they, you average their age together. They can both barely drink. I mean, this is in the he's US. Count, anyway. He's counting the days to be able to play legal poker in, yeah. in a casino. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I, there's obviously this this younger immaturity to it, and I, I think I think maybe maybe Clicker thought that he was in a more private setting than he was, yeah. and that played a role. But I mean, either way, I, I think if you wanted to talk to one of your good friends about what happened, that'd be one thing. But when you do it in, in that setting, I mean, he made a mistake. I think I think it's clear that he, he shouldn't have done that. And yeah, you don't you don't want to talk to your to your team about that. But um, yeah. And there were like, you know, there's, there's like communication. I've, I've pointed out several just kind of like failures of communication within our team. I think this is just like another example, right? Cause like if, if Clicker's frustrated about how the coaching's going and like Landon is not, and like, 
it this like blindsides him then like how have they not spoken about this right like how has this not how has it not just been laid out between them like at some point along the way like hey i don't think this is like working well like can we figure out why this isn't working like you don't just you don't just show up and like do your hours and then like go on tilt and then like break apart it just like wasn't a very healthy team relationship i suppose yeah and that's part of the problem with having so many people in there and so many groups um yeah that's gonna contribute to that all right. Well, I want to say thank you for coming on here and and, and answering these questions for us. It, it gave us a better insight behind the curtain and kind of understand why the decision was made. And, and you know, th thanks for coming on and giving us your take. For sure. I appreciate it. It was good to talk about this. All right, guys, we are here with the recently declared victor of the Heads Up No Limit Challenge, Bill Perkins. Good to have you here, man. Thank you for joining us and congratulations on your victory. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm 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 very happy. Um, it was it was strange to win this soon. Um, but yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> that leads me right into my first question here. What the fuck? Uh, I think that's the only <laughs> thing that I can really say because when I saw that message, I was shocked. Uh, I, I think that there was just so much going on. There was so much talk. The the winnings weren't that much of a swing either way it was it was i would say it's fairly even he had a slight lead he wasn't super behind pace where he needed to be it just it just kind of seemed out of left field were you surprised to see it end like this yeah I, I was definitely very surprised i mean the structure you know most of the discussions when they were setting up the bet behind the scenes was worried that i would quit like i would go boating or i wouldn't take it seriously and i'd pause them and then we just match would take two years to play right so there were penalties for like not playing enough matches and there was also penalties for quitting um but i knew i was never quitting right like i i, I at least within the standard deviation right i was prepared to lose two three four million bucks on this thing so i, I felt there would have to be a lot of blood before anybody decided to quit yeah, I think I think some people were worried that what would happen with this would be something similar to when you played Phil Galfond in the PLO heads up challenge. Right. Can you expand about what happened there? Because I know you guys started to play and then I think didn't what, what happened with that? Well, the, well, the issue was is the site we were playing on, right? We, we had it on. Um, Phil has his own site and Phil has there's certain reps and warranties that you have to make as a player on that site. And one of them even though I am a St. Kitts residence and citizen and I can play out of the country, they wanted me to represent that that is what my residency was at the time. Like, not that I just have house there, but that's, I'm a resident there, right? That proposed, that posed tax problems for me. So I couldn't play on a site, right? Because I was a okay. yeah, full-time resident of St. Tom, U U Virgin Islands. So the attorneys were like, hell no, hell no. And then in the midst of all this on, um, uh uh not poker stars not on party poker um they flagged my account so i had to take a picture of me in saint uh kits with the newspaper well there's a pandemic and they wouldn't let anybody in right so i couldn't i couldn't fly into saint kits and do the thing to get verified so that was shut down and so it was just really a pain in the ass to actually play like i had to get on a boat go into a another place, find place where we have money on the sites. And I think ACR wasn't an option for Phil or, or not. And so it just got, it just got impossible to play at a pace that would be been fair to Phil, fair to the fans, fair to the bet. So it just kind of fell apart. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's effectively over then I would say at this point, I, I, would, I mean, I paid out all the, all the side bets oh, okay. I had with, um, you know, poker shares was like, Hey, we want to pay out. It's not going. So I paid, you know, I paid out on that. I mean, I'm open to it to keep going later on, but you know, I want my summer. No, out. I mean, if, if you, if, yeah, if you paid <laughs> out, it's all good. I just think for a lot of people, when they saw what happened there, they didn't know maybe about some of the logistics issues. And I saw a bunch of these types of comments out of the gate. Like, well, maybe Bill could, if he tries, he'll win, but is he going to be boating? Is he going to be traveling? Is he going to be doing whatever? Or, you know, maybe Bill just doesn't fucking care. You know, I, I think that that was one of the things that people were betting on. Um, in this challenge. And uh, I, so I want to, I want to, that's not, to irrational. that's not irrational. That was, there was a serious conversation between Lara and I. She was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How are you going to do this? Like we're going boating. We have all these plans. You told, I, you specifically told people almost like nine months in advance, don't fuck with my summer. Like my next summer, like we've been locked up and caged. Right. And we're like, 
do not mess with the summer. And I was like, hey, I can work it. I can do it at night. And then when we're in Europe, you know, I get up early and that's late for them. So it'll work. So, you know, Lara had buy-in. I, I kind of took it seriously, but it was, I think there was a real, like that was not a bad bet to go like, hey, Bill's just going to wind up quitting and enjoying life. Yeah, I think I think that it had some equity for sure. I will say you told me you said, all right, I'm not doing these late night sessions anymore. Lara said I need to cut it off a certain hour and then I'm going to be more dedicated to that. And then I want to say two weeks later, you played me heads up until I think four or five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so addicting, though. It's just so fun. You want to like you get these when you're learning, like you get these new toys, right? And you're just like, oh, I want to yeah. try it. I want to play. And, you know, you just get down the rabbit hole, you know? Yeah. I, so I can say this stuff now. I, I didn't want to interfere much when people were betting because I know you, I know Landon, I've chatted with both of you. Um, I didn't want to sort of blow anyone's spot or say anything that could hurt action. I, you never want to kill anyone's action, right? But I got to see your game develop over, I don't know, we played probably eight, 10 months, something like some, right. some kind of period like that. Right. And by the end, you were, you were tremendously better. And I, it's it's not surprising to me that I think you played a lot better than people expected. But do you feel like you played up to the bar that you wanted to set for yourself? Do you feel like you played at a level that you're proud of? Um, I, I feel good about how I played. I'm not like, oh, wow, I did excellent. I crushed it, whatever. I, I feel that I found a way to put in the time, right? Because you can bring somebody to the best poker school or college or whatever, but it, it doesn't matter if you're in Harvard, if you don't go to class, you don't study and you don't put in the work, right? And no matter how easy they make it for you, you still have to put in the time. So I was proud that, you know, I was like, you know what, just do a little bit each day, do a little bit of drilling each day. When you, I call the guys, let's play, let's battle. You know what I mean? We battle, battle, battle. So, I, you know, I was very proud of that. Um, I could have put a little extra time on Drilla and study time, self-study time. Um, and I was, I was pleased. I I'm not like, oh, man, I was kicking ass, but I was very pleased. What, what is your honest assessment of how Landon played? The, the good, the bad, I, you know, just don't sugarcoat anything. If you think he did something, what's your honest assessment about Landon's game? Um, I think he did some things that were very sharp, right? Like I'd, I'd been playing and then in review, but like, that's not a thing. And I'm like, Oh, that's pretty sharp. The kid found a thing. You know what I mean? In, in, in GTO. Yeah, and yeah. then I, there were there's certain spots of the game where, um, you know, you don't know in the beginning because you just don't have enough hand sample. Like, is this variance or is this like something he's doing wrong? Right. And then as, you know, when you pick up certain solve spots and you're not getting the complete frequency of what's happening, right? Obviously he's making errors. You just go, oh, kid's sharp. Oh, this is sharp. Oh, I didn't know this, whatever. And it's spotty. But then as you get to 2000 hands, you get to see his game, right? And then it's like, oh, he's good, but there's nothing to fear here, right? He's definitely unbalanced. He's unbalanced here to this line. He's unbalanced to this line. So he had some very typical unbalanced spots that we're just starting to exploit uh, last two, three sessions. Yeah, and I, I could see sort of in the chart, I feel that there was a, a non-showdown. So he posted his graph, I'm not sure if you've seen it online, but he was winning a non-showdown pretty handily and losing a showdown. And then the last couple of sessions, it, it felt things maybe were moving a bit in the other direction. Usually when a player is losing a lot in red line, it's very bad for the other player because you, that person just gets run over. Um, did you feel like you were winning enough of the pots? Or do you think he was playing spewy where you got to win more than your fair share in the showdown pots. How did you feel that it was going from, from a non-showdown perspective, showdown versus non-showdown perspective? So, so it, it evolved over time. So, the, it, you know, my beginning strategies was even if, you know, you know people overfold here or under bluff here or whatever, we're not exploiting. We're just playing GTO, right? So yeah. that's it. We're just trying to baseline his game and also at the same time baseline my game. Like, where am I making mistakes relative to baseline, right? Because in the beginning... You know, it's like I'm using the wrong sizes on certain textures and et cetera. Like I'm making these big blind mistakes and, you know, my coaches are like hammering it into me, drill this, don't do this, you know, in hand review. And then, um, you know, I felt there was one match where it was particularly bad. We played four hours and it was a night. Uh, it was a day. It was a day of or the or after the night when the ACR asking about gambling scandal blew up right? Like mini kerfuffle. Um, and, you know, Berkey brought it up and we all agreed that it should be 
we should say something about it and that we should and then if we say something about it, we have to be completely transparent and put the messages out. And Berkey was very adamant, like, hey, you know, I don't want to be left to hang and dry, high and dry. Like, this is just my decision, which it wasn't just his decision. And I said, fine. And so when it went out publicly, Berkey felt, and he was actually right, that I didn't stand up for him enough and can, was clear enough. Can you give us some backstory about the kerfuffle so that people, can, can you explain it a little bit? More okay, so, what happened? so, so. My understanding is, is that in a conversation, ACR had asked about betting on the match, okay? Didn't say that they were intended to bet or whatever, but just betting on the match, right? Which uh, Berkey correctly pointed out, creates at least the air of impropriety, uh, impropriety and that this causes a problem. So Berkey was like, you know, what the fuck? How can you be betting on the match or asking about betting a match? They walked that back. They were like, just for our players to bet, bet. but the cat was already out of the bag, right? Felt that asking the question alone created some sort of like, oh, what's going on, right? And I, didn't, their team, my team, nobody wanted to be like, oh, the site was rigged or they were betting on it. We didn't want anybody from the site betting of on course, it, et cetera. Yeah. And so we, we went into like a, a little mini, you know, black hole of spinning of like, oh, you know, when really the odds are very small, right? There, but non-zero given the things that have happened in poker, right? So people are extra sensitive to this. So the decision was made to make it completely transparent and then just move on, right? So Berkey posted the, the messages. He forgot to remove a cell phone number. Oh no. So, oh, so, no. So, so, so that whole like, listen, we're gonna be virtuous and transparent to the betting community and the poker community that, hey, this concern came up, we're gonna move on, whatever, got a lot lost in the fact that, you know, these telephone numbers were on there and, you know, Phil- Phil, Phil Galfon? Uh, no, Phil, Phil Nagy. Phil Nagy, Phil, okay. Okay. Phil Nagy. You a, lot know, of, a lot of Phil's, a lot of Phil's. Yeah, 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 Phil Phil <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so also, uh, Jeff was supposed to let Phil know we were doing this beforehand. There was an assumption that he did. So Phil guy got, got blindsided, plus his numbers blasted out there. And so there was this huge explosion behind the scenes, right? You doc, you know, I'm getting docs, whatever. And he checked it. And then, you know, they, they kind of came at Berkey kind of hard. And I, you know, I made a statement that was like, hey, this was all our decisions. And Berkey was like very upset. He felt like, you fucking threw me under the bus. Like I'm the guy out there pushing this thing or whatever. Then I got mad at Berkey <laughs> because I was like, I was like, what, you know, what do you want me to do? But I also felt like, like, tell me how to remedy this. But I also felt like I didn't put him under the bus. So I'm like, you know, yelling and cursing at Berkey in a message, like slow your fucking roll. And then MJ's like, you did kind of like not do a good enough job. And I was like, oh fuck shit. I'm sorry. What do I need to do, right, <laughs> to it go sounds, fix this? It sounds so, like, like mistakes were made, sort of across the board. Here. Across the freaking board, like it was, it was, it was a pretty much a clown show on on this little thing, and I was one of the clowns, right? I I did not do to the level and standard of 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 showing that this was a united decision, and Berkey took some some heat that he should not have, and MJ went out and tweeted and, and, and corrected it. I retweeted it and you know, connected, but you know, people were feeling salty all around, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> for, for various reasons. And, and I, I was just like, oh, and then I was up late that day. And then my kids were coming all day. So we played a four hour session with me in like, not happy to begin with, because just the, the stress and the drama of that going on. Then, you know, my kids were, you know, kept interrupting during the match or whatever. And you could just see it. I get red line. I get steamrolled. <laughs> I'm, I'm over call, I'm, I'm calling hands that I shouldn't be floating with. I'm folding hands that I should definitely be floating with. And it's just like a bad session. Right. And it's not that bad when we go through the solvers, but it, it's pretty bad and you can see it. And it was four hours. Right. And he wins like, I don't know, four buy-ins that session or something like that. Yeah. And, and th those sessions, sorry, not, not to cut you off. Those sessions, by the way, can be pivotal in a match, right? One yeah. session where someone plays really bad, that can be it. When you, when you look back, that can be the difference. Yeah. And so my co coaches were like, you should have just canceled it. And I, I just have this obligation. I just have this false sense. It's like, a, a, I think it's a flaw that like, I said I was going to play, so I'm going to play. You know what I mean? Like I, I said at the time when I can easily been like, hey, too much of a drama today. Like my kids are coming in, you know, distracting me. 
you know, every two, two hours. You could see it in the chat when, like, when we were talking, I'm like, wait, hold daughter, wait, hold daughter, you know? So I had like the family thing going on and there was this- Can't you just tell your daughter, hey, I'm playing for a lot of money here. I need to focus. I can't deal with it with, it, with the issues right now because she, she's not, a, you know, really, she's not like a baby. She's a no, but teenager, there were, there were, I think, right? Yeah, there were things that needed attention and there was some in, uh, personal family drama. And I also have like, there was a period in my life when I was married, when I was playing poker late at night and missing and then not getting up early and Steph would be the only one to get up early with the kids. And I miss those moments. And I have a lot of guilt about missing okay. that time. And so I've made, I'm like, I am not, if my daughters want me to poker, I don't care how much money is on the line. I'm stopping, right? They need to know that they're the priority and not poker, right? And so that is kind of in my, you know, this is whether it's a flaw or not, that's the decision I made. Sure. And so so I'm, I'm never saying, hey, don't interrupt me because of poker. Okay. It's yeah. not a thing. I, I, <laughs> I can understand. Let's talk a little bit about Matt Berkey. And I want to specifically talk about this because it wasn't even that long ago. It was about three weeks ago. I came over to hang out with you we on, on the lake. We were boating around and we had a, a, we had a little conversation about what's happening. And you said, you said to me, I don't understand. I must be missing something. I don't get it. They're telling me that I can't win. And I'm looking at this and I'm just going to win. I, I'm, I don't understand. I must just be missing something. You, you were you were worried and questioned yourself and and well, can can you walk me through where you were at three weeks ago and and sort of what led you to feeling like that? Yeah, I mean, I would I would you know people were doing the streams and I'd watch the stream afterwards and these quotes and I was just like you know Berkey is like you know nine was too much but you know I'm a buyer at six right and then the other host goes. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like Landon is crushing at nine big blinds, whatever. Like he's crushing Perkins. And I'm just like, whoa, like, I, I, do I have cognitive dissonance here? Am I, is there some leak in my game that everybody can see that I can't see that's, that's so big. And, you know, I was like, you know, at that time I was like, yeah, I think Landon is a non-zero favorite. Right. Cause I'm catching up. Right. Like I'm, I'm don't know anything about heads up and then I'm catching up, catching up. And I expect to surpass him. Right, that was my bet, or at least match even, so that there's no way my average big blind deficit would be nine. Right, I'm thinking that my, you know, my belief, whether it's true or not, is that over the average of the match, my, I would be like a two to four big blind favorite. Right, and that, and and so even when we were playing at that stakes, and they were saying, "Oh, he's crushing at nine, I was like, I was thoroughly confused. So I was going to my coaches, and I was like, "We're grading everything, grading every hand." right? Seeing all the plays. And I'm just like, I went to you and I was like, what do they see? Why do they believe what they believe? Because as a trader, right? You're never just like, I'm right. And the market's wrong. And that's that, right? You're always questioning your assumptions, right? You're always looking for the hole in your argument, your thesis, or what has changed that you're missing. And so I came to you as a third party observer, right? You're completely unbiased, right? You're not on my team. You're not on his team. You're not like my coach. You're not going to sugarcoat it. I'm like, what the hell do they see? Why do they believe this? Yeah, the old, and we talked a little bit about this, and there are only two things that in your game that I think are a bit dicey. And, and one is you split in some sizes that make the game tree very wide, and you know you do that. You yes. split, you use, more, you use a lot more sizes than people might use in different situations, and it makes the game tree much wider and much more difficult to do. Uh, and then the other thing is once in a while, you'll play a hand where you get a little bit out of line. And, and, and there was a, there was a, there was a three bet triple off where you had second or third pair when we were practicing. Yeah. And, and, and you, I think you, you, you ran that hand came back and said, yeah, that one wasn't good. Yeah. So, so I say, that, that big, I, I have that problem where I'm turning hands in the bluffs that did not need to be bluffs. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, that does not go in your bluff category. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And consequently, the same thing, there were hands that were supposed to be in my bluffs and like they need to be in, right? Because you're yeah. putting all these other hands. And so that had to get beaten out of my game um, over time. Let's talk about the nine big blinds because that's the theme of the challenge. Can Bill overcome nine? Can can Landon actually win at a higher clip than that? Or can, sorry, can Bill, can, you know what I mean? We land and overcome nine, you understand. Do you think that nine was fair? Because I, I, I like to think, these things separate, think of these things separately, right? As a gambler, you make sure you get good spots. That's that's sort of your job is to make right. sure you're getting it in good. Do you think that it was? I, I think it's pretty clear at this point you got it in you got it in good. But do you think that that negotiating to nine was fair? Do, do you do you feel that 
that was something that he could realistically be. I mean, it's not, you were not going against up, uh, going up against a world-class elite heads up player. You're going up against a, a kid who's on the up and up. He's won some American sites. He won a tournament last year. He's got a good team behind him, but he's still very new. He's not a top pro. Do you think that nine was, was, a, was a fair line? I, I don't know. I mean, let's put it this way. If I was him, I would not have given me nine. Um, but I, I think like, look, I knew nothing about heads up, like literally nothing. You knew that, right? Like I was just clicking buttons when I first started playing you, right? And challenging you and playing you. And, and, um, wait, wait, what about hybrid? Hold on. Didn't you have hybrid poker at that point? Yeah, but I wasn't doing heads up. It's just ring, right? And it's okay. a different game, right? Ring and heads up are two different things. Um, you know, playing 82% of the, right, <laughs> your hands and, you know, calling off with ace five on a bet, bet, bet line. Like, like this all, this just so much, it's such a deeper and more complex game. And so I'm like, I, you know, I'm telling the guys, like, I got to learn heads up. So I have to go, you know, from the good part about his bet is like, I don't know anything about heads up. I have, I must've been like a 25 or 30 big blind dog, which my coaches told me from the beginning, like, Right now, Landon probably beats you by 25, 30 big blinds. But how can they, I mean, how do they know that? What, what sample they just like, Landon have? Because, the, because like, they're like, you're making direct EV spots, losses, not like frequency mistakes, but like, this is grayed out. And when you do this action, you lose 20 big blinds or whatever, right? And you're playing 100 big blind poker. So they're like, we add these up. We could just look at your game, add these mistakes up. And just in direct EV losses alone, you're going to get your ass. Right, but isn't, isn't that you, that's you compared to theoretically optimal, right? Yes. That's not you compared to Landon. And that, that's, that's the point that I'm making. Right. They, they, they could say, hey, Bill, if you play someone really good, you're going to lose at 25. That, Cause that's kind of easy to estimate. You could estimate within some degree, but you don't really know where Landon's at. Right. Yeah. But I mean, like somebody comes out at you, like I didn't challenge Landon. I wasn't looking for this. He came to me. Right. And he's like, somebody says, Hey, I'm gonna beat your ass. You like, you best believe he can probably beat your ass. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I, you know, the guy wants to fight you and bet a lot of money. It's like, uh, I need to go to the motherfucking gym because I don't want to get my ass beat. Right. And so, but I think what they, there's two things they underestimated. Um, they underestimated hybrid, hybrid poker's learning system. I know some people are probably rolling their eyes or whatever. Yada, yada, yada. It's a bit you of a meme in, in some chats I'm in. There, there's yeah. definitely some meme going on. Yeah, yeah, rolling their eyes or whatever. But it's a really great accelerated learning uh, system. And the key word is accelerated, right? I seen it. A lot of people have not seen it. And so I'm like, they have no fucking clue. Actually, a couple people have been demoed um, the previews. And it's fucking out of this world, right? I'm just going to be, I'm no bullshit. It's out of this world. And everybody who's seen it has been like, yeah, it's fucking the dopest thing that's out there. Right. So um, that's two. So that I would be on an accelerated learning path. And then one, they didn't know that once I fucking went on the line and said, Hey, this is bet. And I talked to Lara and I worked it out that I was going to put in the time like that. They completely 100% had a good side, but once I locked it in, I was going to do it. I did it, you know, and they made the mistake of talking shit about me mid match when I would just go, it's not like I'm going to crumble. I'm like, well, fuck, maybe they're right. Let me go learn in three bet pots where I'm getting lost. Right. And so they literally lost EV. I'm not saying that they would have lost the match or whatever, but like spots where I was definitely making mistakes. I went in and plugged those holes. Right. Right, and yeah. I went in and went and plugged other holes in my game such that the coaches gave me, here's your new weapon. You now unlock check raise on flop. You now unlock this, you know, this, you unlock this. And so I was unlocking shit much quicker than planned and plugging holes that might have stayed a little bit longer where he would have got money yeah, from. That's that's a strange thing. I and and so I I have also played a heads up challenge recently. Yeah. Um and when I, when I, so look, I have needled Negranu endlessly for forever. And there was a lot of trash talk back and forth, but once it was clear, oh, this is on, it, it kind of got to a point where I don't, you know, at this point it, it, it's put up or shut up time, right? I, right. you either, you either win now or you shut up and I, I'm not going to win or lose a session, then needle him. We're playing again tomorrow. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, really, yeah, yeah. it doesn't actually, yeah. once, once the fish is on the hook bill, it's on the hook. You don't have to, there's, yeah. you know, you don't have to dangle it out there. It's on the hook. You either reel it in or you can't, that that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the point. So it was, it's a little weird to me to be talking shit 
in in the middle of the match when you're just going to be playing more anyway and especially in a match that i, I think overall was pretty even I, I, I actually sorry did you, do you ever you have, you have something you want to say about that i know you tried to yeah yeah I, I mean my, my thing is is like if you're running psychological ops against your opponent you don't go like you suck and we're gonna crush him or we're crushing at nine right now the guy just goes in the fucking lab harder right? Like, I'm not a guy that's going to give up. Like, I would be like, wow, it's really tough. And we're barely going to squeak by and he's really learned well, or whatever. And keep me complacent. Right. You know, and I was like, I am not fucking complacent. I, I like that change from me playing one and a half hands per match to three to five hands per match hand played. So if we sorry, played, sorry, what, do you, what do you mean exactly? I don't understand. So, so, so before, so I practice against my coaches, right? We get on Zoom and we play and we talk about what's going on, whatever. And then we download all the hand history and we go through all the hands that saw a flop and we solve them, right? Any significant spot gets solved or anything that's even a remote question in the edge spots. We go over that. Then there's drill time, right? And so let's say I was going one to one or one and a half to one, right? Like I paid okay, 500 hands in them before match. That was going to like three, four, five to one battling right and studying and battling right and and that that whole shit talking completely changed that right and i was just like why would you do that like you're definitely losing ev even if you're not losing losing the match you're just losing money you know i would just be like yo he's playing great if he keeps up at this pace man it's going to be a tough match like that's the things i would be saying i i, I don't i yeah that, that makes sense i i don't understand i don't understand the ending to this I know we talked a little bit about this early earlier, but but the ending it, it just so just to zoom out right. There's a graph online. You can see what nine big blinds per hundred looks like, and the actual graph that happened. You can see where he was at. He wasn't that far off that line. He wasn't that far away. He was up a couple of blinds in EV. He needed to be up four and a half. And I, I, I guess where I'm driving this is. I have to imagine he wanted to continue playing because as the guy in the seat, you, you of course want to keep going. I'm sure the stakes weren't something where he had to really sweat that badly. I know a lot of people had pieces or whoever was behind it. I know Berkey, I don't know the exact action, but the point is I can't imagine he wanted to end like this because it looks, it looks, you know, foolish no, for him. No, it, it, it's my firm belief that, uh, you know, Landon wanted to continue to play or whatever. He's part of a team. So he's got to go with the team. He's, he's the talent, right? If the head coach says, I'm benching you. You get benched, right? There's nothing you can do. But he, I'm pretty sure he's like, put me in, coach. I, I can do this, right? Um, yeah, I think I think so. And and even in his there? suite, it said it said we we are decided. You know, I, yeah. I don't I don't think I that think, that's I think what he I wanted. think I, I mean, you know I would I would bet dollars to donuts that we was the coaches and you know he's he's kind of like well I gotta go, I gotta go with what they say right like he's not gonna go off the reservation and so so it's really like okay what did the coaches see right so the coaches went from they went from, hey, what do they see? They're crushing at nine bigs blinds to we quit, right? And so was it me? Was it Landon? Was it loss of faith in Landon? Was it, was it, was it, was it me? They saw my game getting stronger, um, you know, or common, some sort of combination of both. And, and for, the, for the viewers at home, we're bringing on one or two of his coaches to talk about that. So stay tuned. It's, it's coming. We're going to get some answers there. I'm going to demand to find them. How, okay. did, how did you feel about the ending, Bill? How did you feel about it? I mean, there, there, was, there was two aspects of it. I, I, felt, I felt like like the last three matches, uh, you know, I got that, that, that terrible thing behind me and was playing well and playing spots where, like, everybody was learning, right? Like, wow, you know, this was – your your poker intuition deduced correctly to like what GTO says. Right. And I was doing some things that were like a lot sharper and correcting previous mistakes. So I was catching a groove, right. Wasn't afraid. Wasn't, you know, kind of understood Gand Landon's tendencies and was just, you know, mowing along and also fixing one of the biggest mistakes was like playing fast. Right. I get excited. The music playing, I'd start clicking fast and then like not really think through things. And here's a prime example in the beginning of the match, I wasn't three betting enough. And the reason why is I was playing too fast because you get a hand dealt like king five. I don't have to click roll. It auto rolls every time I click. So I wouldn't even pay attention that the roll was a 16. You know what I mean? And king five is supposed to be three bet here, right? right but right. I always know king queen suited aces, you know, king. I always know yeah. the nutted hands to bet, right? So 
Right. My three bets were way too fucking nutted. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, dude, you did that versus me a bunch, especially in our early matches. Your three bet was way too low. And then some, some of the later ones, it, 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 you even realized it and you messaged me about it. You're, oh, I didn't three bet you enough. And I said, yeah. yeah, you didn't. Because <laughs> yeah, when you're playing fast and the thing clicks, you don't go yeah. and look, right? Like, and so I would miss all these spots, like seven, nine off. And I'd be like, oh shit, I rolled a one and I didn't three bet three, seven, nine off or whatever it is. Right. right. And so that a lot of those, like, and also these decisions, like, dude, you're supposed to be raising here and the, you know, and the bet small check, bet small line. Right. And I'm supposed right. to be raising with this hand is like, you're not even thinking about where your hand rank is in your range. And so a lot of these thought processes got thrown overboard by me playing fast. So as you see me slow down, you, you see my play get better. And, and right. you know, Matt Boyd was like, look, let me put it to you this way. We're going to take a knowledge test. I get a minute and a half for each question. You get five seconds. We're going to bet $25 million. You want to make the bet? And I'm like, no. He said, exactly. Slow the, you know, slow the fuck down. Yeah, totally. And so, and so, so I did. And I was feeling, I, I, like, my confidence was skyrocketing by the last three months. I was like, I, I don't, I mean, I feel confident I'm going to win this outright. You know, I have a good shot at winning this outright. And I feel like I'm going to have to run bad to lose nine big blinds, right? And so I, it got to the point was like, hey, all I want to do is not run bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of variance in this game. I mean, totally. We could be dead even and it could be 40 buy ins, right? Somebody can lose 40 buy ins and you can't really say anything statistically relevant about that. You can say, oh, I think he's better than the other guy. Meanwhile, the guy lost $1.6 million, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's funny because if it happens, he's probably losing quite badly. But the answer, but not absolutely, he's probably losing very badly. So it's hard to speak in absolutes in a lot of those situations. Yeah. What did you think about the, so as far as the terms of the bet went, because this was something that people were inquiring about, wanted to understand a little bit better. I think a lot of people thought that if somebody quit, then he would have to pay the nine big blinds for the whole sample. I saw a lot of people making that comment. Um, but my understanding is he paid the nine big blinds per hundred on all the hands that were, were played. And then he, there was also a $200,000 side bet that he had to pay out. Is that, is that correct? Um the structure is correct. I don't know the numbers. I, I'm okay. like one of those guys like makes a bet, throws in, in the sheet and does and forgets about it. Right. Like I, right. Need, a, I need a bet clerk. Okay, I need to hire do, a bet clerk. Just don't tell anyone about that publicly and you should be fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really on the election bets, I had to rely on people going, Hey, I owe you 17 bitcoins. I'm like, really? Oh shit. You do. Oh, thanks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. actually, you bet with one of my friends, and I, I think, I think you might have not even realized who he was after, and then he had to t explain. I, I think it might have been fees or who, who, who or Bryce. You bet, you bet with one of my friends, and then didn't realize. Remember, you had a bet, and then also didn't know who they were. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah. who bounced? And somebody posted, and I'm just like, oh my god, yeah. you know. And so. You know, it's just kind of procrastination of putting it over. It's like, oh, I'll deal with it later. Like, I literally, I'm paying a clerk to go through text messages to figure out what the bets are. But the structure was this, and it was mainly on their side. They were worried I was going to quit, right? And so the structure, and they were also worried about, like, bad runs, blowouts, right? Like, you know, the backers don't want to have infinite money on, on, at risk, right? And so it was who you, it only the loser can quit, right? And they have to pay, pay the pro rata, right? You lose pro rata. And then the penalty on the side. So that was a structure. The amounts, I can't remember. Okay. So it's a little bit weird because when I think about the challenge I just played, it was quite clear from day one, if this gets off the ground, no one's quitting. I think that it was just, you know, in my challenge, we both have egos that are way too big to quit. Yeah. Um, and, and the bankrolls that could withstand the punishment at those stakes to be able to just you know, yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I, I would have, I don't know how much I would have lost, but I would have been willing to take some pretty heavy bruises there before, before throwing right. in the towel. So I guess it's kind of weird when I think about quitting in these challenges because, and this actually is a, is a kind of good topic. I think there was a lot of action on this challenge back and forth on whose side, who would win, what would the win rate be, all these kinds of bets. I think a lot of people, if they had realized that, as you mentioned before, Landon's backers would throw in the towel like this, um, after such a kind of nothing burger, I mean, you know, a fourth of the hands have been played. It probably wasn't exactly what, what they had wanted. Maybe you played better. Maybe he played worse. But I can't imagine the people who bet on Landon like the way that this went down. Oh, my guy was up small after a fourth of the way in, so he quit. That had to, if people realized that, I feel the odds probably would have been a, a lot different. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I think the odds, first of all, set were, were di- ludicrous, right? Like, I, I think those odds I was cashing in on, on my past reputation, right? Like I earned those odds kind of, but they weren't, <laughs> but they weren't, they weren't set right. And I, I was, I was kind of, I mean, I was equally as shocked too. Um, and there was even some confusion because people were like, oh, you got nine big blinds. I'm like, dude, I bet 250, 500 at four and a half big blinds with poker shares. This was never about the fucking nine big blinds, right? This was a challenge and I was playing to win. Like for me to give up the time for my summer, it costs money. So I'm like, okay, 720K edge plus, you know, that I'm going to get extra. That's just for me to show the fuck up, right? You want to- Nice, wanna, it's a good wanna, life. Yeah, well, I mean, you want to fly Floyd or Connor, man, they get paid when they show up in the damn ring. You know what I'm saying? Not, and then there's a prize if they win. And I'm like, look, you want to take me away from this, that, and the other thing in my life that I value so much, uh, and I'm going to have to shift my priorities around and stay up late. You got to pay me, you know? And so, but once I, once I accepted that challenge and I was going to go, that's it. I was like willing to put more money in, right? Like I already got my paid. So now I can bet for one half, you know? And I was just, yeah. I was taking it in to where is wherever I can get the extra, you know, play 500, a thousand is what I wanted to play in this match. Right. Yeah, I definitely, I, 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 I really feel, I, I kind of talked about this really already, but I just want to say it again. I feel like you hustled Landon fairly above board, not, not, not in, a, in an angle shooty kind of way, but you just wrecked him on the negotiating process so hard for this that you got to, to a, a, you got a big blind per 100 that was really huge for someone that wasn't even that good. I, I just don't understand what he was thinking to accept that. It's, and, it's- it's like it'd be like a night 12 year old girl be like i can beat you in arm i think you know, like well i wouldn't even take advantage of Ouch. Girl, but like, girl, <laughs> oh, wow. i mean i'm just like if you come up and say you're gonna beat me in arm Ouch. wrestling i'm like okay you're gonna like i this negotiation was three tweets like it, it wasn't like this sophisticated back and forth it was right. like i'll take x right because i was really trying to beat you into playing me right i know I was, you were i know you were i was like i'm trying to get 10 yeah. or 11 from you no he, shot that, that was happening yeah, and then he comes in, he offers a number, I, I show a number, and then we just met in the middle and it was done. It happened like that fast. But the middle was so, the middle was so, it was such a bad middle for him. Um, I maybe, maybe he thought, maybe he just thought that you were gonna be a lot worse or may, maybe he just expected. Well, I wanna push back on that a little bit, right? Sure, like, go for it. He got a, bu- he didn't have all the backers. He got backers to take him, okay? Right. At that number after maybe they were upset about the negotiation but they weren't upset enough to put up the money right right yeah right they could have been like no this is a bad spot no then on top of that after they saw me play okay this is so i'm shitty as can be to, when they make the bet okay and then after they saw me play they're like oh we're crushing at nine big blinds i'm like how fucking bad can the line be if you guys put up money then saw me study and then we're still like, no, we're still crushing. Yeah, but then at fourth of the way in, I'm done. This is just, this is too much liability. It doesn't make <laughs> sense, Bill. It doesn't I mean, make does, sense. There is something incongruous. I think they had a cognitive dissonance about the line in the beginning. But I'm not like, listen, natural gas trading, I'm as sharp as they fucking come, right? You want to talk about entrepreneurship, business, some life optimization, you know, and I, and I tell you something, you want to challenge me to a knowledge bet, you know, I'm taking advantage of you. I don't fucking know. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't yeah, go yeah. into a, a calculator and be like this. I was just like, good enough for me. Feels like I, I can win that, right? I'm just like, you know, and then my coach was like, you got to negotiate something stupid. Let us negotiate, you know, the, the format of the match, et cetera. Those guys, their teams went back and did all that shit. I just became the talent. I'm like, tell nice. me what to do, coach right? Like that shit's all on you. I'm not the negotiator. I cut this deal via Twitter. Okay. <laughs> now let all the teams and managers and whatever do whatever they got to do. I'm just the talent. So the thing about Landon was I, he did not have everything squared away when he was negotiating that it's kind of obvious it was happening. You tweeted, he went back and forth. So I, I didn't love that, you know, and, and I had an opportunity to be involved and I know some of the people that were involved and it was brought to me after. And I guess I just felt first off, I, I probably wouldn't have gotten involved in this either way, but to get invited to be involved after someone has offered to pay nine in this, where there's already a lot of people, I just, I just, guys, I'm just not interested in being part of this huge, you know what I'm saying? It just, 
To be Tom Marchese there, wanted to bet me more. Why didn't you? I could because I honestly at the time I was like, am I gonna? I it was a real question of how seriously I was gonna take this. Like it was not like everybody's like, oh, you got rooked on the line. I was like, dude, even I did not take more from Tom. I was like, well, Tom knows what the fuck he's talking about. You know what I mean? And yeah. I don't know heads up poker, like. You know what I mean? And then after I, I like learned and Tom was like, no, nah, you could have got me a lot more money, but nope, I'm out, right? I'm out. And so, so I, I, I kind of have to push back on this. Like, I mean, I think it was a bad line in retrospect. I think like once you knew I was going to put in the effort, you're, you're getting, you're getting smoked. Right. I, um, I, I actually think here that, so you ended up being better than what people expected, but I think the most important here is that pe- the landing was worse. I, would you agree? I mean, I mean, I think I, 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 I think so too. I mean, I, I, you know, Landon has very sharp aspects of the, his game, but like, you know, he's not Doug Polk level player. Oh, thanks, uh, Bill. No, no, I mean, he's not Doug Polk layer players. He's not, you know, wizard. Like, you know, everybody has leaks in their games and different styles, etc. But like, you're going to be a more solid and aggressive player and less unbalanced than Landon, right? And and you know, there's going to be. Yeah. You know, when, when I look at your game, now that I can actually look at a game and study a game, right? And I look at your game and be like, oh, in these lines, he's unbalanced here. And these lines, but it's not like there's all these massive up leaks, you know, that are around. You just have the standard, you know, this shit is fucking hard. Everybody has leaks. leaks. It's you know super I mean? hard. It's a very yeah. difficult game. It takes a lot of time. Well, And by the way, Landon should be much worse than me. This was, so first off, I was a poker pro for many years, right? I mean- half of Landon's life or more. And then the game that I played was heads up, no limit. And then that was the one I was the best. You know what I'm saying? This is, this yeah. is, I, I should be a lot better than Landon. Yes. If, if I wasn't, there would be some pretty big issues here. Right. right. Um, and, and that's, that's why the, the, the nine was so ridiculous because in my career, I won it nine or 10, probably closer to 10 it, versus Negreanu. I won it nine EVBB. Nine is a good solid win rate from a top player versus someone that's, you know, good right that right. that that but that's for a world class player i just yeah it was it, he he well, bit well, off more it, than he, it was he two errors do. right they thought i was shittier than i was and and they thought he would be better you know they overestimated his ability um i think uh there and that's no slight on his game right his game is amazing for the time he's put in and it and where he's at right that's no slight against landon but like there was just a lot of habri that 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 got in there and i think there was a lot of disrespect you know obviously my ego is going to be like there's a lot of disrespect because there were knowledgeable seasoned pros betting that line and wanting to bet more despite what you say about landon uh, 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 despite what you say yeah. about you versus the daniels these are smart guys they had the same logic you have right they still yeah. wanted to bet more at nine so i'm just like anybody who says I, like i rooked i'm like you guys are fucking clueless like this was a three tweet negotiation i didn't negotiate this and top pros like a gaggle of fucking pros were backing landon it was yeah. my money only on me nobody had you know <laughs> nobody had anything like i well, was you like had, selling pieces well what I was, was good, more what was good for you was you already had your team squared away you'd already worked with them for a while it was a small team and you had all your own actions so the moment that the moment that this was live you didn't have to focus on any bullshit. You didn't have to focus on people. You didn't have to focus on backers. You didn't have to focus on hiring new coaches. You didn't have to focus on the integrating of those coaches. You didn't have to focus on any other shit. No. It was, I'm the talent. I've arrived. And you, exactly. get, to, you, you get to walk in and yeah. then you get to like, get your pump up song, you know, and then yeah, you go yeah. out there and you throw punches and then yeah. in in interrupt, you're in the gym. That's all you have to do. Correct. Um, that, that was, that's an edge, right? That that's an, and, and that's part of the, the, the whole thing of a challenge. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a, it was definitely an edge. And, and when they, you know, getting into a spot when we play hand and have it already pre-solved and be able to look it up or whatever is a huge advantage. Like they want to solve something properly with the proper bet sizes that we're using in the range. It's like, they got to fucking spend an hour. Right. <laughs> I'm like, but, yeah, I, I, I'm going through every significant spot in the match every single time. They can't do that. They don't have the time. It's impossible. It's, it's interesting because uh, if I could see the hand sample of, of both players, I could, I could give such a great analysis of 
but I don't have anyone's hands, right? Well, we, so. were, we were talking about that. We talked about, hey, what about after the match? And the coach was like, well, I don't know. Let me think. Like showing yeah, you know, I get it. every hand revealed. Because if, if he reveals his hands, whatever, we could just run it. And we could tell who got lucky. You know, luck is kind of hard to do because, like, sometimes you get lucky. There was a hand where I flopped top full. And the board double paired and Landon gets away from, you know, a thing. And it's like, was he lucky? Was he not lucky? Whatever. Like, who's lucky? And that conversation like, gets really shitty. Yeah, it gets dice. But you yeah. can count direct EV mistakes. You know, I can see hands where it's like, that's a great out fucking box. Doing that action is like a seven big blind loss. Well, you it's know? tough even then, Bill, because it depends what options you have in the tree. So if you put in some options, for example, on a lot of rivers, you use more bet sizes than I would. So if you have three or four bet sizes on a river, and then I have two, then if you put in mine, it'll say, oh, that's an EV mistake versus this, but it depends what we're running for. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, it does. It depends on, it depends on the tree, but like we can easily expand it and run split, split the tree in PIO, right? And then, and run it and be like, okay, if you only had this size where it's like bet or check, then this is the proper thing. You know what I mean? And then this is the EV difference, right? So, I mean, yeah, it is, it, it is more difficult, but it's doable. Um, and, you know, you just see like people roll over hands and it's like, that's not a bluff combo or yeah. that's not a calling combo, right? Yeah. Like that's just like a hundred percent. I don't care what you have in there. That's just you're over calling or you're way over bluffing like this. You turned a hand like I let, let's, let's use me. I turned a hand into a bluff that's not supposed to be bluffing. Right. Like it's a direct EV loss. You just gave up seven big blinds, you know, in EV. Yeah. Right. Whether he called or not is as irrelevant. Right. And so that's how I was getting graded. Um every that's good. Yeah. Well, I, I know Lennon had great people he was working with. Yeah. Uh, I, I know he did. Um, so I, 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 you know, and I've worked with some of these people, so I, I, I know the coaching had to have been good. Right. I, I, I got the same, it's kind of similar to you and Negreanu actually, where right. you had the same coaching as Negreanu. So, so, you know, so we both know, we basically were involved in two challenges in a row. I wasn't involved in this one, but the coaches were involved in the same two challenges in a row, basically. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think yeah. the difference, like you hit it on the head is, is that the gap between, you know, you and Negranu to start was greater than the gap between Landon and I to start, Definitely, right? Yeah. And also think about this, like these guys were still programming, developing the system, et cetera. Like I got like version four, beta version 5.0 and Daniel got 1.0, right? And so I'm building on the knowledge base as they build out the, the, the package and the way they're gonna teach it to me and how that information is gonna absorb in the brain. So that was also an unseen advantage, like because it's not a static company, right? The company is evolving and growing and making its product better to easify learning. And so that was an advantage. And so I think, you know, their bet was heavily dependent on me going, fuck it, I'm going boating. I'm going vacationing. I'm hanging out with my daughters. I'm not gonna study. I'm not gonna, but I'm too busy or whatever. Well, I don't know, man, you did all those things and you still won. So maybe it was less dependent on that than, than we actually ended up thinking. <laughs> maybe you know, a little bit goes a long way. You I, I, showing up, you know, I sure. also, sorry. So what were you I was saying, saying like, like half a life is showing up and I showed up, man. I put in, I put in, you know, I put in the time. And that goes a long way. Um, I, I also felt on that subject for Landon, I, he was doing a lot of things that I, I didn't really like to see in the middle of it. For example, he was going and playing live tournaments and, um, you know, doing social media stuff or, you know, gym workouts and whatever posts. And, and I'm not to say, not to say you shouldn't have a healthy balance while you're studying. Cause I think you should, but this is the biggest moment in his life. This is an opportunity to win something on sort of the worldwide, uh, you know, uh, stage. And instead he's doing these small things that in isolation, not that bad, but if I was in that situation, I would be doing everything that I can to win, to make sure that I play my A game, to implement the best strategy that I possibly can. Take it as serious, because because if he wins this, it's going to be something that people will always remember about him. You know, this is this is this is something that will will follow you for forever. And it's right at the start of his career. This would be huge to win. I guess I just felt maybe he should have been spending a little more time working on his game. Uh, and I, I, I look, I, I don't know. I don't know what his schedule was. Maybe he spent eight hours. He spent the other two doing other things and, and he, it was fine. But the way that it, it felt looking at now, on the like, surface, I would have to agree yeah. with you. And I also, I mean, personally, like I took that as a sign of disrespect and it just made me want to win and study more. 
I was like, oh, they think you're so bad and you have no shot that they're talking shit on TV. They want to bet more at six big blinds, right? Meanwhile, I bet four and a half fucking big blinds with poker shares for 250, 500. You know what I mean? They're like, I'm going to bet six. I'm like, okay. You know, like, and, and, and then Landon's like, you know, whatever. It's like, kind of remember when Rocky, when he gets rich and he gets soft or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, he, yeah. Right? It's kind of like, it was like, I, that's what it reminded me of. It's like, oh, Landon's getting soft. He's like winning. He's Landon's the rich guy in this analogy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just, you know, <laughs> what? he's the champ. He's the champ, right? And the champ gets soft because he's had some success, right? And he doesn't hit the gym as much. And then like, then he has to like throw away all the shit and go to Russia in the mountains and, and work out old school, right? And get back in it. This would be more like the guy at your local gym winning two rounds in your in your metropolitan area and and putting on the and getting too soft. It's a little more like that. Yeah. I don't I don't know if it's Rocky level. Yeah, I mean I'm I, I mean it's the only movie I got. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah you know what I mean. Like that's fair. Listen, Landon is they underestimated. Once you underestimate your opponent, you already de facto underestimated the amount of work you have to put in right right yeah there's that right and then on t so they were so they were they were all in my mind they were always not going to be putting in enough work because they underestimated me right they're unbalanced in study right like if they overestimated me he might have studied too much right and overstudied and i had a balanced life the other way but they they basically underestimated me and so they they and they got complacent you know they got complacent. And when I would, you know, I was getting scored every game, every match. And it's just like, okay, you ran a little bad. You made a couple of space where you're playing B minus game, whatever. Here you're playing B plus, slow down, make whatever. And then I'm getting better and better and better, you know, and he's kind of just, if he's understanding, he's staying stagnant relative to me or, or the spread is collapsing. And, you know, and, and at the end it should, I should pass him, right? I should be big blind favorites. Well, you know, Bill, it reminds me of the, uh, you probably haven't heard this one, but the grasshopper and the ant. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> the beginning story of my book, Die With Zero. Shameless it, plug for Die With Zero right it, here. It, it, it's, it's littered through there as well. And, and yeah. I, I will say, so I, I read Die With Zero recently, uh, and I thought it was an amazing book I, for me. It was an amazing book for me. It, it's, it, it feels written for young to middle-aged people that have already had that have a lot of money everyone can get value out of it but right. i felt specifically for me it was it was fantastic it to see some of those you. concepts you yeah. know what i'm saying yes yeah because yeah, I, I, think... I have enough money to be able to actually capitalize on some of these ideas right well yeah i mean obviously i mean the book is a modeling book right and it's about not wasting your life and optimizing your life and the more money you have the more opportunity you have for wasting your life right the more the more resources you have the more waste you can potentially have in absolute terms. So it's gonna to speak to people with a lot of resources and be like, holy shit, I'm wasting a lot of resources res with respect to my net personal fulfillment. Whereas somebody who only has a small resources, yeah, they may be wasting or they can, un they're under saving and they can get a model, but it, the magnitude isn't as great, right? So everybody, like you said, everybody gets value, but the magnitude really, really hits you hard. And maybe the value of this experience made the whole thing worth it for them. We had to model that. I don't think we- Yeah, we, that we got the, I mean, he, you know, he learned a lot, right? Like dealing with team members, you know, um, you know, challenging, negotiating, how you estimate people, you know, set up spots, et cetera. So like he, he's definitely, um, and he also learned a lot of poker. I mean, Landon's sure. good, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I can, I was just yeah. gonna say by match three, I think I, I was like, yeah, Landon's probably a one big blind favorite. Like there's no fucking way I'm, I'm making 22 big blind mistakes on, on the river calling off it here, you know, or whatever, whatever I'm doing. Right. And so, you know, I could be like, yeah, I'm, I, he's a better golfer than me. Right. Like, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm in, at the driving range every fucking day, you know, hitting balls and, and practicing sand, sand, getting out of the sand. And so, you know, so if, if Landon's willing to pay one big blind per hundred, you're running it back. I mean, look, I, I know like behind this, behind the scenes, there's, there's talks of challenges, right? Like, like, course, redoing yeah. it. and a different structure, like no big blinds but maybe two to one or something like that, or three to one or four to one or whatever. I mean, people dream up their structures, right? Right now I'm like, I'm the fucking talent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like go talk to my coaches and negotiate that shit, you know? Uh, uh, but I am not opposed to uh, future because, right? I'm, I'm trying to be self-aware of where my game is right now um, versus, you know, GTO God, right? And, 
and and then kind of wherever other people are and where I fit in that 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 pecking order. And so, you know, if I study over the summer at leisure and still play in battle and I, I after World Series of Poker or whatever, and, and like you people want to play me heads up, no, 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 um, no, no big blind, whatever, I'll be like, I might be like, okay, let's go. All right. Well, we can look forward to that. <laughs> like, yeah, let, let's go. You know what I mean? Like, let's go. Like, I don't fear anyone. Even though like my, like my coaches like mop me up sometimes, right? Like they're just running my ass over because they got more Ginsu knives and are fucking with me. But uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I want to use that. I want the fucking check raise river pair straight blocker all in bluff. Oh, I love right? that like, one. I didn't have that one in my app quiver, right? But then you, I'm like, that's fucked up, you know? And so once I unlock those tools, you know, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's go. But like you can, if you learn GTO well enough and you're at like, a level you just can't get exploited they just can't beat you too much right yeah it's hard to get to that level though because it i think is, i think hard. i think even a lot of top guys are, are not there yeah it, the, it's it's hard it's hard to be balanced and that, and that's the key and it's ways like okay i'm a human i'm not going to re remember every sliver of these fucking uh bet rebet bluffs or whatever like which hands do i jam them in that i'm like at least statistically unexploitable right and so the these things you know, they take time, but I, I'm like, I got into this thing. Like I started, I got into this thing. Like I took on this alter ego of Emperor Pal 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 Palpatine. The music's playing and I'm going, ah, young Jedi, you want to bet I will three bet you. You know, like, and I would just <laughs> adopt this persona and I'd be aggro as fuck, right? Like I'd been like, I have the proper bluff combos, you know, and just <laughs> amazing. <That's laughs> like, amazing. and so like, I will crush them. I go, you know, so I was just like, I'm getting stronger by the day. And like, it was a fun way to make poker fun again. Like, okay, I'm this dark evil emperor that's got to beat this young kid, right? And I'm just like, okay, this is the Empire Strikes Back version. Right? The one, the one where I win, right? And so, um, and you're I would just- You're sending Luke to the swamp, basically. Yes, yes. And I would like get stronger. And I posted a mem. You could see the uh, meme with the uh, Emperor Palpatine. He's like, you know, I get stronger every day, you know? And then th then we didn't get to play after that. He quit. <laughs> so I think the the, the Emperor Palpatine meme, meme, they were like, oh, shit. Yeah. He's coming to slay Jedis, you know? And so that was my alter ego during this match, late in this match. Nice. Good, good to get you pumped up. I, one last thing about Landon, and you, you've, you've alluded to this or even directly said it, and I think it's important to note. He did really put himself out there, and he is a good poker player, and he's an up-and-coming poker player. And to put yourself in the middle of the arena like that, especially in a spot where it wasn't it wasn't a great spot for him, he, he you know, he did his best, and and I think that you have to respect the, the effort and the um, – just the being willing to kind of put yourself out there. Cause I think a lot of people, they're afraid to take those swings. And if you don't take those swings, you never really kind of find out where you're at. So uh, I think, you know, I, I think it's important to have um, a respect for what he did here and, and, and competing. And, and also, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what his opinion was personally when it all came to an end, but um, you know, for being willing to, to take some responsibility himself, the way that he, he talked about, you know, he basically sort of admitted as much that, he bit off a little more than he could chew. And, and I, and I think he, he dealt with the results with, with grace. Yeah. I, I mean, say. like Landis, Landon, it, from my respects was solid. You know what I mean? And you know, there's just on both sides, like the, you know, the mob, you put yourself to the subject to the mob and then the opinions of the mob and like, yeah, we're getting crushed and Perkins, you still suck and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, what else? You know what I mean? But he's got to deal with this too, as a young kid coming out, Take, taking a, a swing at a wreck and then if the wreck wrecks you right it's it's asymmetric right it's like oh man you got wrecked by bill perkins like sky didn't even know like you know <laughs> sky, oh, sky. I, I don't think he got wrecked i think he was worried he was going to get wrecked yes and i think the team was going to get wrecked but i think i think despite the fact that he didn't get wrecked he was exposed to that and and more so than the monetary just kind of that undertone people talking shit looking down you know the poker yeah. community oh i know yeah. man when i played my match i i i knew that was coming uh, yeah. the, the first few sessions i ended up i think it was down two or three hundred k early on and man people the, the gates were getting unleashed people were marching the streets they had the pitchforks <laughs> out 
<laughs> my yeah. head my head was already on all of them. I, I didn't even know how it got there. <laughs> you were just like, you suck, blah, blah, blah. And if you win, you're like, you're the greatest. You know, it's not, yeah. it's just not like that, right? Like the results are 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 like almost anticlimactic. And honestly, I was getting better the more I looked at the match and like, okay, this is a quiz. This is a drilling quiz. I, I stopped trying to win and just did what my coaches said. And this is a quiz. Okay. It's a bet over bet line. And I have X, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, right. do I call, do I raise, do I, whatever. And well, like, I, you should look at it. Yeah. yeah. Every spot was like a quiz, you know, each action ding. And then, and then I had to remind myself, use the fucking time to think get through. You know what I mean? Don't just click the fucking button. Then the music plays fast. I click the button. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm jamming. I'm like clicking the buttons. I'm like, wait, slow down. <laughs> All right. My coach well, was like, I knew you exactly had this hand. And I knew you exactly had this hand because the timing tells, you ooh, know, that's not good. They, they were yeah, watching. You know what I mean there? You have exactly. Were there, the were there timing tells this match? Um, For me? Yes. I was giving off timing tells. Um, My, my coach is clearly pointed out i do not think landon was and as a matter of fact i was annoyed i was like why is he taking all the way down to the counter to act in this simple spot but i was like this is what he's supposed to be doing right yeah no matter what it is he's supposed to be thinking it through and being consistent and i was like depending on what was playing excuse me <laughs> depending on I what see. was playing yeah i was jamming and clicking buttons or i was thinking it through and i like really had to make a mental note slow the fuck down. I wanted to say this about the timing thing you said earlier. I think that it's kind of standard ish protocol and heads up to play at the speed of your opponent. So if one guy plays slow, both play slow. If one guy plays fast, then usually both play fast. It's only a huge issue if if you're playing really fast, jamming out to some tunes, and then he's time, which is fine. I think I think that they're they're both fine. You just kind of kind of have to get in the same page. Yeah, I definitely had to get in the same page. And and honestly, for me as a newbie, you know, just learning the game of heads up. Like I, I, I hadn't staged forward, you know, memorize all these spots. Like, oh yeah, I got four, five suit, seven, eight, seven, eight suited that you didn't three, you know, whatever hand you didn't three bet, four, five suited, you didn't three bet it. It's fucking going bananas on these flops. You know, I yeah. wasn't thinking through these things. Right. And so I couldn't possibly be doing it. You know, it's just a lot of information to digest and a lot of heuristics to, to remember. And then the exceptions to the heuristics. And so, when, when you're playing fast, it's just, you know, I was giving away EV. Just, just plain and simple. I'm just spewing EV, both in timing tells and not thinking. And I, I have been there. All right. I have one last question for you here today, Bill. It's the one everyone is, everyone's waiting for. Who wins in a heads up, no limit match online? You or Phil, the greatest Helmuth? Who wins? Heads up. Online? Online. online. I mean, come on, you know it's got to no be Bill spot. Perkins. It's got to be Bill Perkins. It's got to be Bill oh, Perkins? Yeah, I mean, he does have the white magic, but that's live. I don't think he has the white magic online. Is that is that an open challenge here, Bill? You I mean, I, Phil? Open to, I, I do not want to play before the summer. Please don't mess with my summer. Guys, like, guys are coming out of the woodwork. Mike, these things are fun. I mean, I think they're entertaining. I mean, it's funny because you'll ask, like, what questions do you have for Bill Perkins? And then, like, there'll be, like, all these questions, and one guy will be like, who gives a shit? And I'm just like the 50 motherfuckers ahead of you that's who yeah. gives a shit i never get that i never get that response when people say that no <laughs> one cares about this then why are you responding <laughs> and then just why ignore it man it's it's empirically you can prove it empirically it's like demonstrably false these are all the people yeah. watching and, and and clicking about this but uh i think it'd be fun I, I'm, I'm, I think I can defeat White Magic online. I'm not so sure live. You know, I don't know if he's got weird stuff's happening. Reads on some people or whatever. Like, strange shit has happened. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disfill that way. But I think I got him online. What about, what about you versus Daniel Negreanu? That's a good question, Mike. Uh, that'd be a fun match, right? Because it, it's like the inter-school fight. You know what I mean? Like to believe I am the best student of hybrid. You know, like who's the best student of hybrid? Do, 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 do your coach just have to each split and then pick a student? Is that is that how that goes from there? I mean, <laughs> just battle each other and it just be it would be literally like a kind of like a memory retention and discipline case. And then the natural style, right? Like, you know, I'm a little bit more spewy, but I'm also a little bit more aggressive than than a guy, right? Like, because okay, sometimes you you do shit that's not allowed, right? Or I'm a little bit sticky and I overcall too much, right? Like, and then you know, Daniel might be a little bit more conservative, but not blood, you know, like so. How does my natural style play against his natural style, right? Like, do my leaks play into his strengths, right? Like, 
Yeah. If I'm an over bluffer and he's an over caller, that is doubly as bad, right? I, I, I think he matches up well versus you, actually. I think that that's my first instinct. It, it, there is there is a there's a rock paper scissors element to to heads up where some styles are just naturally better versus other styles. Right. And and when I was coming up, there were guys that that I just so I always really matched up badly versus the jungles of the world where they just would call me down all the time thinking I was full of shit not nonstop because I was usually full of shit just a little bit too much <laughs> often. Um, and then the the guys that are the, oh, he has to have it here, just fold. I, I just killed those guys. Those guys just, yeah. Those, those guys just got run down in the streets. Um, right. So, so yeah, so you, you have matchups. You don't want your leak where you're unbalanced to play into their unbalanced the other way. It's just like, you're just shoveling the money to over to him. Right. And so like, if I'm an over bluffer and he's over call it, the money's just flowing into his pockets. If I'm over bluffer and he's an over folder, then, you know, nothing's happening. Right. Like I'm just, I'm making money. The money's going the other way. Right. And so you, you, you kind of, you kind of, you know, everybody has their, their, their unbalances and you, you're like, all right, how does this match up here? And then you have to dial it back. You have to like, okay, this guy's an overcaller. I'm an over bluffer. I need to stop over bluffing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's uh, hard though. So it's hard. It is, it is very difficult to rewire yourself. Um, and it takes a lot of discipline. And, I'm, and I can tell you this, if you're playing fast, you're not rewiring. You know what I mean? Like you're just going straight to default mode. I, like, I'm a good fast player. When we play, if we play fast, so my, my take is always, I'm fine to play fast with people as long as it's equal, right? I, I'm not going to play fast while you're playing slow, but I think I play well fast. Um, so I've never minded just duking it out quickly with people, you know? Well, by the end, by like the fourth match, I started playing, I wanted to play uh, Matt Boyd and I was like, let's just play four tables so I can get a lot of hands and I just want to get hands in for a review, right? And he was like, Wow you couldn't even keep follow the action for two tables for a bit. Now you're following, you're four tabling, you know, fast and heads up, you know, getting, he's like, I'm really impressed with your attention. So, you know, over time you get better and better. Like you've been playing for years. Right. And so like you've stage four, a lot of things that I'm still like, what do I do here? Oh yeah. This is an except it's, but it's a paired board, half pot size, you know, whatever, you know, going in my head where a lot of guys are like automatic, click, 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 click this yeah, texture. Yeah they're recognizing textures and it's just flowing and it's just muscle memory. Like when you drive home, you don't even realize how you got home, but you just, you just got there. Right. Like you just, cause you're, you know, you know the route. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's a road you're familiar with, but I'm, I'm, I'm ready for some white magic. I think I can, I can defeat it. All. I will destroy the white magic. <laughs> Perfect. Nice <laughs> note to end on bill. Thank you for joining us once again. Congrats on your victory, man. Enjoy your summer. You earned it. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. You too. That's a wrap here on the Doug Polk Podcast. Thank you for joining here today, everybody. And if you think you would like to hear more of these, well, make sure to subscribe over on YouTube at the Doug Polk Podcast or on your podcast platforms like eventually, hopefully Spotify and iTunes will be on all of them down the road. The Doug Polk Podcast there as well. Okay, guys, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you again next week.